sound, awesome. Hello everyone, really great to see you all today. Uh, my name is Luke Pascarelli, I am the president of Why Should I Believe at Georgia Tech, which is one of the organizations co-hosting this event. Just a little bit about us really quick, and the slide's not up. Okay, that's fine. Um, <laughs> you know, for Georgia Institute of Technology, there's some things we still don't do very well. But, uh, that's okay, we'll roll with it. So anyways, let me tell you a little bit about, about Why Should I Believe? We're a Christian apologetics organization here on campus. We believe in applying the lens of reason and science to Christianity to discern its truth value, and that's what we do weekly. We meet over at the Instructional Center on campus on Mondays at 6.30. And if you're interested in learning more about us, we have a table outside where you can sign up for our mailing list, and you can absolutely talk to me afterwards. We also have a Facebook page, so feel free to check us out there. We post weekly updates on what our events will be and so on. So anyways, it's a little bit about why should I believe, and now a little bit about the debate. First of all, I want to talk about what this debate is, and then I want to talk about what this debate is not. This is a pursuit of truth and understanding, and what do I mean by this? I mean, God is objectively real and has objective truth, and it is our job to align our beliefs with that objective truth, and that's what we're doing here, pursuing that truth. We're also pursuing understanding, understanding of people who think differently than us, and how they think, so that we can better just uh, converse with them and understand people. So that's what this debate is. Let me tell you what this debate is not. This debate is not the intellectual analog of the UFC. We aren't here to watch a couple of intellectual heavyweights throw arguments at each other and see who emerges victorious as the champion to the roar of the audience. We're here to pursue truth and understanding. So what does that mean for you as an audience? It's really simple. It really boils down to just respect. Respect both of our speakers here. Respect the people around you because not everyone shares your beliefs. So the other thing that also means is ask great questions. Both of our speakers are very well-read individuals who have devoted most of their lives to studying this topic. So they'll have a lot of evidence and a lot of points they've made that you may not have thought of before. Feel free to jot those thoughts you have now uh, about those topics and ask them. We'll have a Q&A session at the end. Uh, with that being said, I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the night, uh, Dr. James White. Dr. White has a number of apologetics degrees from seminaries across the nation. He's director of Alpha and Omega Ministries, which is located in Phoenix, Arizona, and is a Christian apologetics organization. And he's very well read on this topic. He's debated topics within this vein multiple times. I've seen a number of his debates, and I'm a huge fan. Uh, so let me now welcome my friend Hassan up to introduce our other speaker and kick off the night. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Luke, for that warm introduction. My name is Hassan Asif, and I'm the president of Georgia Tech's MSA, or Muslim Students Association. MSA is a nonprofit student-run organization here on campus, and in fact is the only one representing Muslims here at this university. Throughout the school year, we offer a wide variety of events. Our social events include football tailgates, sporting competitions, and monthly general body meetings. Um, and we offer Friday prayers, Quran study, and Islamic history on Thursday nights, as well as monthly group discussion meetings. Uh, we also offer an array of volunteering opportunities and interfaith outreach opportunities for our members. If any of you would like to join our organization or join the emailing list, you can find us on Facebook. Uh, just Google, or just put uh, Georgia Tech MSA into Facebook. You can come talk to me. We also have a table outside. Or you can send an email to contact at gtmsa.org. Uh, in essence, our organization strives to create a welcoming and collaborative environment for Muslims and non-Muslims alike on campus. And we also work to bridge the gap between Islam and other religions here. And that's precisely why we're here at tonight's debate. You've already met Dr. White, and now I have the uh, honor to introduce Dr. Shabir Ali. Dr. Ali is an internationally renowned Muslim scholar who travels the world to represent Islam in public lectures and interfaith dialogue. He holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Religious Studies from Laurentian University with a specialization in Biblical Literature, and he also has his Master's and PhD from the University of Toronto with a specialization in Quranic Exegesis, or Interpretation. He's the President of Islamic Information and Dawah Center International in Toronto, and he explains various topics from Islam in his uh, television series called Let the Quran Speak, and you can find some of his episodes from that on QuranSpeaks.com. 
It's also worthy to note, and Luke touched upon this, that our, debates, our debaters actually know each other. They're friends, and they've debated multiple times in the past. And even though logic and proof are necessary components of a worthy debate, the one thing about that that we know is mutual respect. And tonight, we happen to have mutual respect here on the stage. And instead of just a simple debate composed of clashing opinions, we'll have the opportunity to witness true and amazing interfaith dialogue. <laughs> with that being said, let me talk about some of the technicalities of the debate tonight. The debate will begin with 20 minute opening statements from each debater, starting with Dr. White. And then we'll move on into a rebuttal period, where each debater will get 10 minutes to refute the comments of the other debater. This is followed by 15 minutes of cross-examination, where one debater will get to ask questions to the other one, and they're going to sit at their tables and discuss. So each debater will get 15 minutes to do that, starting with Dr. White and then Dr. Ali. And then after that, both debaters will get five minutes for their closing statements. Um, and then, like Luke said, there's going to be a question and answer uh, series at the end. We'll have all of you guys, those of you who have questions, line up in the middle, and we'll ask, um, we'll, we'll alternate between the two lines. And we'll have that go on until 9.15 p.m. Finally, before, uh, before we begin, a couple housekeeping notes. Let's take a moment right now to check our cell phones and make sure that they're either turned off or on silent. I say this because this event is being recorded, so we ask that you don't record from your phones, as that is both distracting to yourself and also the people sitting around you and actually the people sitting behind you. If you need to use the restroom, the restrooms are actually on this floor right outside on the other side of the stairs. Uh, and if you need to exit for the restroom or for any other reason, you can use the doors in the back, uh, not the ones up here. And at this time, the debate will begin. Dr. White, I now, I now ask you to come up to the podium and make your opening statement. Dr. White, everyone. Thank you much, very much. It is an honor to be with you this evening here in Georgia. Uh, we have a very interesting topic to address this evening. I would say that about 50 out of the about 174 debates I've done so far have been with uh, my Muslim friends. I, I think Shabir and I have debated probably six, between six and nine times. We debated in South Africa, Canada, London, um, all over the place. And uh, so we've addressed this topic before. And in my experience, when the topic is Trinity or Tawheed, the focus is completely upon the subject of the Trinity and almost never upon the subject of Tawheed. Uh, so I really think that it's important that maybe this evening we try to even things out just a little bit uh, as far as dealing with the subject from both perspectives. And so let's begin with a definition, because most of the time, objections to the doctrine of the Trinity are based upon a misdefinition of what the doctrine of the Trinity is. This happens a lot in my experience uh, in the debate, so let's try to avoid that by making sure that you understand we believe that there is one true God. One true God. In the Old Testament, the divine name used as one true God is Yahweh. Sometimes you hear it pronounced Jehovah. And we believe that that one true God has revealed himself to exist in three divine persons, the Father, the Son, the Spirit. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. They are distinguished from one another. They take different roles in the economy of salvation. They are distinguished from one another by the actions that they, they, they undergo in our salvation, as well as the relationship that they bore to one another in eternity past. Now, I believe very clearly that the doctrine is revealed, especially in history, in the incarnation of the Son and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which means that the New Testament is written by experiential Trinitarians. They're not trying to say, hey, we have this new doctrine that we want you to understand, and so here's our defense of it, because the New Testament never bothers to do that. Those who wrote the words of the New Testament were individuals who had experienced this revelation. So Peter, Peter had heard the Father speak from heaven. He had, he had walked with the Son. He was now indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He was an experiential Trinitarian. And so they speak. That's why it just naturally flows. That's why the New Testament writers 
can speak of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Jesus, and, and just flow between these things. And, and the Trinitarian passages about, about the, the love of God and, and, and the, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, it just flows along and they never stop and say, oh, let, let, let me explain what I mean by that. They don't have to do that. This was already the experience that was theirs as the church. But what is important to understand is I think one of the greatest evidences of the deity of Christ is the fact that the New Testament writers take passages that were specifically about Yahweh from the scriptures and apply them to Jesus in unambiguous fashion. They knew the Old Testament scriptures. They take these passages that are about Yahweh. Not just vague things about Yahweh. Yahweh is king, Jesus is king, therefore Jesus is Yahweh. No, that's not what I'm talking about. They take passages that are specifically about Yahweh as, for example, the eternal creator and apply them to Jesus. Now, Dr. Ali has rightly said about Jesus, if he is not Yahweh, then he cannot be God. But Dr. Ali joins to this correct observation a fully erroneous one, that Yahweh is Unitarian in his existence. So, for example, he will undoubtedly argue that in Isaiah chapter 42, Yahweh speaks of a servant that he will send, and then, of course, Matthew identifies that servant as Jesus. Therefore, if Yahweh is Unitarian, then Jesus can't be Yahweh, he can't be God. That's where the erroneous assumption comes in, because, yes, Yahweh sends Jesus. The Father is identified as Yahweh. It's Yahweh that, that places our sins upon the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. So if Yahweh is Unitarian, Jesus can't be Yahweh. But the problem is the very same New Testament writers then turn around and they identify Jesus as Yahweh. So if you have the writers taking the one divine name, applying it to Father, Son, and Spirit, that might tell you that they were indeed Trinitarians. So where did they do that? For example... Very quickly, I don't have time to develop all of these. It's a, it's a, it's a really fascinating study uh, if you want to dig into it. But for example, in John chapter 12, verse 41, after quoting from the famous uh, vision from Isaiah chapter 6, you have these words from John. He says, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and he spoke about him. If you go back to Isaiah chapter 6, whose glory had Isaiah seen? He saw the glory of Yahweh. He saw the Lord sitting upon his throne, and it's Yahweh who speaks to him. And in fact, in the Greek Septuagint, it even uses the word glory as something that Isaiah saw. So if you ask Isaiah, Isaiah, whose glory did you see? Isaiah is going to say, I saw Yahweh's glory. If you ask John, whose glory did Isaiah see? John's answer is Jesus. A very unique, not some just some lesser creature representative, no, this is the very temple vision of Isaiah chapter 6. Peter does the same thing. In 1 Peter 3.15, a text that many of the, all of the, all the young guys involved with apologetics know, know the text, to be ready to give an answer, cross apologion, to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that's within you, with gentleness and reverence. But if you read the preceding verse, Peter is quoting from Isaiah chapter 8. And he's actually continuing that into 1 Peter 3. And when he does so, he's saying, set the Lord as Lord Christ apart in your hearts. Treat him as holy. You go back to Isaiah chapter 8. Who you treat as holy? Yahweh. He identifies Jesus as Yahweh that you're to set apart as Lord, Kudios, as Yahweh in your hearts. That's what changes you. That's why Unitarianism has always resulted in emptiness. Because without a divine Savior, there's no change of the heart. And so, true Christianity has always emphasized the fact that when you set Christ as Yahweh apart in your heart, that changes the entirety of your perspective, it changes how you respond to the world, and as such, that is why people will ask us about a reason for the hope that's within us. And then the writer of the Hebrews, Probably Paul, but I, I personally think it was a sermon by Paul written down by Luke. But in Hebrews chapter 1, you have Psalm 102, 25 through 27 quoted. And Psalm 102 is about Yahweh in his unchanging nature. He is the one who is immutable. 
And the author is clearly, when you follow the argument, beginning of verse 3, all the way through, look at verse 6, look at verse 8, all the way through, the author is plainly demonstrating the supremacy of Jesus, and then closes out by applying words that can only be about Yahweh. Only Yahweh is unchanging. Anything else is a creature. Anything else has been made. Anything else is derivative. But of the Son, he says, and then the citation of Psalm 102 is applied to Jesus, to the Son, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10. And so Paul does the same thing if Paul didn't write Hebrews. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 through 11, you have the great Carmen Christi, where there the balance is struck so beautifully. And boy, I wish that we could just spend the whole time in Philippians chapter 2. It's so clear, so compelling in its teaching of what Christians have always believed, that Jesus had eternally existed in the very form of God, but he laid that equality he had with God the Father aside to do what? To enter into human flesh, to enter into human existence. That's the great picture of humility there. No other interpretation gives you humility. That's the only interpretation that gives you the picture of humility that that section is to be. And then, to top it all off, what does Paul do? But he quotes the words from Isaiah 45, 23, where Yahweh says, to me every knee will bow, to me every tongue will confess. And what do you have in Philippians chapter 2? At the name of Jesus every knee bows, and every tongue confesses. All to the glory of God the Father. It doesn't detract from the Father's glory. This isn't one God over here and another God over there. That's what John 5 was all about. Perfect unity between the Father and the Son. Here you have, over and over again, throughout the authors of the New Testament, this theme being struck and being found in the pages of the New Testament. And now to something different. Something different that we have not had in previous debates. I'm sure Shabir is looking a little bit worried. <laughs> Let's remember that the Quran comes to us, at least in its historical manifestation. I realize that there are Muslims who believe it's eternal, so on and so forth. Just a debate on that, found that there's a lot of different opinions on that. But the Quran comes to us in its historical appearance in history. Over 500 years after the completion of the New Testament. So half a millennium has passed between the last words of the New Testament being written uh, and the arrival of even the first portion of the Quran. In the Quran, we have references made to the Torah and the Injil. Exactly what those are meant to refer to is difficult to know because there is next to no meaningful intertextuality between the Quran and what we would call the Christian scriptures of the Old and the New Testament. In other words, there's almost no citation of scripture. Uh, you have a lex talionis that could have been done orally. You, you really don't have any specific citation. There is no, you, you don't have a, a, the relationship that exists between the New Testament and the Old Testament. You have citation after citation after citation. You don't have that. Instead, you have basically oral concepts and so what exactly the Torah, the law, and the Injil, the gospel, means to the author of the Quran is somewhat difficult to understand. There does not seem to be, there's, there is strong evidence that the author of the Quran did not know what the canon of the New Testament was because he includes stories in the text of the Quran that Christians never accepted as scripture. The story of the, 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 the were derived from proto-Gnostic gospels and things like that. The clay birds were made alive and flew away and things like that. These come from after the period of the writing of the New Testament. And so the Quran speaks to Christians as to a group. We are addressed as the Allah and the people of the gospel, as well as the people of the book. And so the Quran warns that saying three will bring you to hellfire. Saying three in reference to God. Now, every single time the Quran says, do not say three, the next line is, there is only one God, Allah. So very plainly, it is the intention of the author of the Quran to understand the Christian saying of the word three. It doesn't use the term trinity, but the word three to refer to polytheism, a belief in three gods. But here's the problem. You already had early church writers like Justin Martyr identifying Jesus as Yahweh, arguing with Trifo the Jew, putting into the words, putting onto Trifo's lips, 
arguments that allow him to then demonstrate that Jesus is being identified with Jehovah God, with Yahweh. So why doesn't the author of the Quran seem to understand that if in fact our argument is there is one God, Yahweh, who is identified with the Father, with the Son, and the Spirit, then why is there no interaction with that? Why is there no response to that? Instead, the argument is, if you say three, it's hellfire for you. There will be no one to save you. Heaven is forbidden to you, and hellfire will be your abode. See Surah 572 for just one example of that rather strong language that's found in the pages of the Quran. So here's the question that, we, that I really, really hope that other than just in all these debates, we sit here and we talk about the Trinity. We never talk about the Islamic side of things. Uh, I mean, most people end up walking out, they have no earthly idea um, how any of these things end up fleshing out. Shabir knows what the issue is. As I mentioned, I quoted him earlier. Uh, this was from the debate four years ago uh, with Jonathan McClatchy. If Jesus is not Yahweh, then he cannot be God. Okay? So he knows what, Shabir knows what the issue is. If Jesus is Yahweh, yet is distinguished from the Father and the Spirit, then clearly the Trinity is the one conclusion one can come to on non-naturalistic grounds. In other words, if you're willing to start cutting the Bible apart, if you don't, if you don't believe that there is a single message to be found in the page of the Scripture, and you can come up with anything you want. You can come up with Vinitarianism, whatever you want. If you want to assert contradiction and all the rest of that kind of stuff, in other words, if you want to approach it in a way that Shabir does not approach the Quran, when he does this television program, the Quran is allowed to speak as the Quran. If you let the New Testament speak as the New Testament, it teaches this doctrine. This is why Christians have believed this for so long. So here is the real question. If Shabir Ali knows what the issue is, why didn't the author of the Quran know what the issue was? Why didn't the author of the Quran? Now, I can, I can anticipate the answer. Well, I didn't want to necessarily address that or was talking about this little group over there. Look, um, unless we're going to get to the point of saying that, that God doesn't know the future, unless we're going to uh, come up with, well, uh, the Quran is just a, a addressing this very small little group over here that doesn't exist anymore, that kind of thing. The reality is that we as the people of the gospel are told that we are to judge by what is contained in the gospel, what are we to be judging? Well, if I judge the message of the author of the Quran and the content of the Quran by the gospel, I have to find it to be lacking. That's why we have, that's why there's still Christians and there's still Muslims, and we're having debates. If we had come to an agreement on this, we wouldn't be doing this any longer. It wouldn't just be for entertainment. And so if Shabir knows what the, the, the issue is, why didn't the author of the Quran? Why does the author of the Quran show no knowledge at all of the divine name? I, I'll be interested to find out if Shabir believes that there is any evidence that you can point to in the Quran where there would be a knowledge of the name of Yahweh. Could it be because his knowledge was so limited that the tradition of the Jews not to use the divine name meant he had never heard it himself? Certainly by, by that time, the Jews would not utter the divine name. So if he was only learning things orally, he wouldn't have heard it being you. So is that a possibility? Um, if saying three sends you to hellfire, why doesn't the Quran address the most definitional argument for the Trinity, which it is then condemning as something that will separate you from the true worship of God? If the Quran argues the Trinity is polytheism, but when we identify the Father, the Son, the Spirit as all sharing the one nature of God indicated by the divine name Yahweh, we are arguing just the opposite of the assumption of the author of the Quran itself. We are starting with monotheism. There is only one God, Yahweh. And then showing the revelation of that one God prophesied in the Old Testament, you look at Isaiah chapter 9, you look at these, these texts, prophesied in the Old Testament, but still the revelation takes place in the incarnation of the Son and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. So why doesn't the Quran address this while it still then condemns this as, and I'll, I'll ask uh, Shabir if he will define for us, please, shirk, 
which is the unforgivable sin in Islam. According to the Quran, all his sins can be forgiven to men except for shirk. And most Muslims with whom I interact believe that our worship of Jesus is major shirk, which cannot be forgiven. And so if that's the case, then I think it's perfectly proper on our part to say if a revelation comes along, half a millennium later, it needs to accurately interact with what it is condemning if we are going to believe what it has to say. We can't just let that aspect of things slide. We can't let those things, they just don't generally come up and they need to come up in our conversation this evening. Why is there not a shred of evidence to be found on the page of the Quran that the author had any knowledge at all that John and Paul and Peter and the writer of the Hebrews had specifically identified Jesus as Yahweh in their writings? Why is that? And if there is such a huge chasm, which I say would, would go against the chain that is forged in Surah 5 as well, beginning verse uh, Ayah 44, 44 through 48, uh, the revelation of the Torah, of Moses, the revelation of the Injil of Jesus, and the revelation of the Quran of Muhammad. If there is that huge break, then how do we explain that? How do we understand that in regards to what Christians believe on this subject, the doctrine of the Trinity? Now, I'm sorry if, uh, if some of that uh, was a little bit, I didn't get a chance to necessarily explain everything, but I, I want to try to sort of move the ball forward. It's one thing to do the same topic over and over and over again, but I don't know how many debates Shabir has done on the subject of Trinity and Tawheed. I know I've done a bunch of them, he's done a bunch of them. Let's try to move it forward into an area that will advance our knowledge uh, especially in comparison with the debates that we've done before, I think that would be a great way of advancement for both of our communities. I think Shabir and I are in good shape to do that type of thing here this evening, and you get to listen in. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. White. Dr. Shabir Ali, you can now deliver your opening statement. <clears throat> Hello everyone, uh, let me uh, begin by praising our Creator and Fashioner, the Creator of the heavens and the earth. I ask you God to uh, bless all of the righteous uh, servants from all of history, bless us all here tonight, bless our meeting, bless our discussions, make it fruitful, uh, open up our understanding and help us to say the right thing in the right time in the right way. And uh, Dr. White, uh, I want to thank you for sharing this uh, platform with me and giving me another opportunity to engage with you and to learn from you. Uh, folks, I'm so thankful that you've all come out here uh, tonight, and I look forward to engaging with you, not only during the, my presentations, but also and especially uh, to hear your questions later on. Now, let me start with uh, the first half of my talk to address uh, the Muslim belief in the Quran and uh, its uh, expression of Tawheed or monotheism. I want to very quickly remind you all of what the topic was about. The topic is Tawheed versus Trinity, and then the subtopic says, uh, is it one person or three persons? Is God one person or three persons? And uh, the, the subject is not really, does the Quran have the correct understanding of what Christians believe? But nonetheless, as Dr. White has raised uh, that question, I will try to address it. So very quickly, from the Quranic perspective, what is Tawheed? The word Tawheed itself does not occur in the Quran, but the concept of the oneness of God, or that God is one, is uh, set, said explicitly in the Quran again and again. The Muslim kalima, or declaration of faith, says, La ilaha illallah, uh, there is no God but God. And this statement is found exactly in that expression twice in the Quran. And elsewhere, some 30 or more times, the Quran says something like, La ilaha illahu, there is no God but He. Uh, or, Qulhu Allahu Ahad, say he is Allah one. So the idea that God is one is something that is emphasized in the Quran. So Muslims will take uh, great confidence, or have great confidence in the fact that when they say that God is one, they are following the scripture which they believe to be uh, the word of God. What is shirk then? Uh, James has asked me to explain. 
Well, uh, shirk is one of those terms that is not so easy to define, but I'll uh, try my best. Uh, it seems to be that shirk is the uh, opposite of tawhid. So if belief in tawhid, in the oneness of God, is the pure belief showing the Muslim allegiance to God, shirk would be anything that takes us away from that tawhid, or from that oneness of God. Um, if one were to worship an idol, that would be shirk. If one were to consider that God has a son or a daughter, that is associating someone uh, with divinity. That would be shirk in Muslim definition. Now, of course, there could be gradations of shirk, and uh, James did speak about this being like a major one. Uh, well, one might speak about lesser grades of shirk. For example, some Muslims will say that if you do a good deed while trying to please someone else other than God, uh, that is, in a way, shirk, because you're supposed to do it only for the pleasure of God. But of course, that is a lesser degree uh, of uh, shirk. Now, the major one, taking somebody else as an associate with God, that is uh, what uh, the Quran promises uh, uh, severe punishment for and calls us away from. Now, why doesn't the Quran then uh, show an understanding of what the Christians believe? That's James's question to me. And uh, in the answer to that is that the Quran actually does show uh, an, an understanding of what Christians that the Quran was interacting with at the time believe. And uh, a scholar recently, Sidney Griffith, in his book, book, The Bible in Arabic, has actually drawn attention to this and explained uh, step by step how the verses of the Quran actually relate uh, to the belief of Syriac Christians in particular, because those were the Christians in the environment with which the Quran interacted. I have to say something then about the mode and manner of the Quran. The Quran is revealed to the Prophet Muhammad and whom peace Muslims believe as the word of God into his mind to interact with his immediate environment. People ask him questions, and he gives answers by way of divine revelation. All of that is collected into the book that we have today as the Quran. So uh, the Quran uh, does not have much interest in commenting upon belief, uh, uh, beliefs of people who are outside of that immediate uh, milieu. However, the Quran does say some things which, in fact, will apply to all. For example, when the Quran says, uh, They disbelieve who say that God is one of three. As uh, some uh, translators put in a trinity, but it doesn't have to be in a trinity, just to say three. And then that's why the Quran follows up by saying, A God is only one God. So the Quran is telling you, don't say three, just say that there is only one God. And, and that's it. And so if our Christian friends were to only say one God and they stopped at that, they would be saying something that conforms with the Old Testament. They'll be saying actually what conforms even to some of the explicit statements of the New Testament writers, which we'll get to as time permits. And of course, they would satisfy the Quranic requirement that you do not commit this uh, shirk. But of course, Christians do not stop at saying that there is one God. Some Christians say that there is one God in three persons. Some say that, yes, there are three persons, but uh, this is not in the Trinity. Uh, but uh, a modalistic belief where the Father comes down onto earth as the Son and then eventually manifests himself as the Holy uh, Spirit. So in either case, various Christians are saying three in one way or three in the other way. And rather than uh, the Quran um, utilizing a lot of words to explain and contradict and deconstruct all of these individual beliefs, what the Quran does is to displace the Bible as the sole reference. And the Quran introduces itself as the book that will command respect, attention, and will become the book of guidance for the Muslims in particular and for humanity at large. So uh, the Quran does this in a very excellent way. Look at the uh, way in which the Quran has actually gripped the Muslim world so that to this day, there are people like myself who did not grow up in an Arabic environment but we learned the Quran in its original Arabic, and we were able to recite large portions of it from memory in the original Arabic. Muslims have remained devoted to this book, and Muslims have remained on monotheism. There's no question about the Muslim monotheistic concept. When a Muslim says, I believe in God, you can be sure that the Muslim knows who he believes in. 
But let's say a Muslim is talking to a Christian friend, and the Christian friend says, yes, I also believe in God, that the Muslim will not be sure. Does the Christian friend mean God the Father? Does he mean God the Holy Spirit? Does he mean God the Son? Or does he mean all three together? So uh, there, there is no question about how the Quran has actually emphasized and successfully done so the monotheism uh, that it uh, preaches. So uh, the Quran is apt in the way it, it actually puts things. Jim says, well, it, the Quran does not seem to know the canon of the New Testament. That's why the Quran is referring to things that is outside of the New Testament canon. Well, do you know, folks, that even the writers of the New Testament have quoted things which are outside of the New Testament canon and outside of the Old Testament canon, especially outside of the Old Testament canon. Because think about it. The first Christians used the Septuagint, Greek translation of the Bible, and that is outside. That has books, seven books, which are outside of the Protestant canon. And, and the New Testament writers refer to those, for example, to Tobit and to the Wisdom of Solomon. And moreover, Jude uh, refers to things which are not mentioned either in the Old Testament or in the other New Testament books. So he's quoting apocryphal works. This is already known. So if James is going to have a problem with the Quran, uh, quoting or, or referring to things that is outside of the biblical canon, but he also expressed the same difficulty with the New Testament itself. Now, the Quran does tell Christians, judge by what God has revealed in the Gospel. But, but that's what it says. It says, just by, judge by what God has revealed. It, it doesn't say judge by all of the gospel, because not everything that people call gospel has been revealed by God. Think about why you have four gospels. And that there are four different viewpoints by four different writers as to what the gospel of Jesus was all about. So the Quran says, Let the people of the gospel judge by that which God has revealed therein. So you need to go back to the Gospels and ask, what did God actually reveal here? There is something, a puzzle for you. The Quran is actually stimulating uh, the thinking of people and getting them to do their own homework. Now, one might say, well, I don't want one to listen to the Quran. But if you think about what the Quran is saying, some Christians have actually thought about this in their own way, not necessarily because the Quran says so. But you will find a website uh, with this uh, URL, God, uh, Jesus Words Only, about something. Look for it you'll see that there are Christians who are interested in just simply following the words of Jesus because they recognize that Jesus was definitely inspired by God and we don't know about the rest of the people who wrote the New Testament. Notice that in James' presentation, he quoted lavishly from 1 Peter. Now, 1 Peter is, it has doubtful authorship. Some Christian scholars think Peter wrote it. Some think Peter didn't write it. Second Peter, that most scholars say, was not written by Peter. And this is alarming, because the, the, write, the letter actually starts off by saying, this is Peter, the disciple of Christ, writing all of this. And now, even some conservative uh, Christian scholars uh, are, are saying that this is not written by Peter. For example, Richard Balcom, uh, in his commentary on uh, the letter of Peter, uh, has said that to attribute this to Peter is a fiction. Now that has tremendous ramifications because uh, that letter closes uh, with uh, an, an assertion uh, or a, a kind of inference uh, that uh, the letters of Paul are also scripture. And if not for this letter, you would not have another statement like it in the New Testament affirming that the letters of Peter are scripture. Uh, that the letters of Paul are scripture. And that brings back the whole question of who Paul was, and was he himself also authorized to teach on behalf of Jesus? So we'll have to speak about that. Many of the authors of the New Testament are unknown, and this is widely acknowledged. Uh, in, in a past debate, uh, uh, James actually quoted with the great confidence and the powerful voice that he normally speaks with, uh, a, a scholar that we both respect, N.T. Wright. And James emphasized the words of N.T. Wright, we don't know who wrote the Gospels. And that's what N.T. Wright actually says. We don't know uh, the, the names of the authors. They're all anonymous. We don't know if John wrote the, wrote the fourth Gospel or somebody else wrote it. And if John, which John? So 
the question that comes back then uh, to be addressed is, how do we know that these New Testament writers were writing experientially after experiencing the Holy Spirit? This was one of James's major points in his presentation. He said that uh, the, the writers of the New Testament did not have to spell out in great detail what the Trinity was about. Why? Because they experienced it. Well, how do we know that they experienced it? If we don't actually know these individuals, if some of them used false names and pretended to be somebody else while writing, uh, how do we know that they actually had this experience? I think that needs to be discussed. To continue then, uh, why does the Quran not show any knowledge of the divine name, James wants to know? Well, let me say something about the divine name. Uh, in, in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, in chapter 3, Moses goes up to meet God, and uh, he sees this angel appearing as a fire, you know, up on this burning bush, and then he goes up, and then God speaks to him, and tells him, uh, I am Yahweh, uh, and go tell the Israelites, uh, this is my name, and this should be my name forever. All right, so if that's the name forever, I think James's point is uh, valid. Why does the Quran not show any knowledge of this name? But then, let's ask, why did the New Testament writers mostly show no knowledge of this name? Why is it that after this name has been translated into Greek, and the New Testament writers are writing in Greek, why are they not writing this name? Why is it that Jesus himself does not utter the name? Why on the cross does Jesus say, Eli, Eli, we must have a Why is he calling to Eli, my God, El? Why is he calling God El instead of calling God Yahweh? Why does he say, Yahweh, Yahweh, why have you forsaken me? Why does he call him Yahweh? So the same objection can be launched there. The only New Testament writing that show, that uses uh, the name, uses it in a truncated form, that's in the uh, Revelation, where those in heaven are given glory to Yah Yahweh by saying, Alleluia. Instead of saying Yahweh, they're saying Yah. Alleluia. Alleluia. So we, we know that, too. Alleluia. So only the book of Revelation. Why is it not on earth, though, if this is what is seen in heaven? So, and is that really the name of God? This is my, this is my next question. Actually, nobody knows the pronunciation of Yahweh. This is why James had to say it's either Yahweh or some people say Jehovah. Why say it two different ways? It's because nobody knows the name. Then the name's pronunciation. You just have these four Hebrew letters. Now, knowing what the Quran is, it, it would be pointless for the Quran to go into all of this great detail to explain about the history of this name and how it came to be like this. Uh, the four letters and how it should be pronounced and how do you convert that to Arabic. What the Quran did successfully was to give the, its readers a name of God, Allah, which in the Arabic language means the God, and it ensured that Muslims all knew who the God is that they're worshipping and they're not in confusion. Whereas in fact, now we are in confusion when we look at the name Yahweh. Because remember what James had said. James said that the one God, Yahweh, Reveal himself as three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. What that means, in essence, is that he's thinking that the one God, Yahweh, is doing something. And if that one God, Yahweh, is doing something, and revealing himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now you have four entities. The one who revealed himself as the three persons, and the three persons themselves. So how do you explain that? Now you have not a trinity, but you need to have something like a tetra-unity. A combination of four in, in one. So the Quran actually uh, avoids all of that uh, detail and gives Muslims the guidance that is actually uh, needed. Moreover, one might even ask if this YHWH was the name of God itself, or was it a kind of play in words? Because in the first instance it is mentioned when it, Moses said, Ask what is my your name, and God said, I am what I am. Ahia, Esher, Ahia. I am what I am. And maybe from this Ahia, Esher, Ahia, from Ahia, uh, uh, they, they, somebody coined the term Yahweh. We don't know the full history of that. Yahweh probably is not even uh, the name of God. Yahweh in Hebrew would mean something like He is. And uh, it, it does not seem to be that, that is the name of God. It's an expression, a verbal expression. So, uh, finally, uh, why does Shabir seem to know more about the Christian 
um, beliefs than uh, the Quran does. Well, um, I don't know more than the Quran does. For, from my belief perspective, the Quran is the word of God, and God knows everything. Um, but uh, if I show more specific understanding of what James uh, is saying, it's because I've read his books, and I have listened to his words, and I interact with him, and I study Christian scholars and what, and what they're saying. So that is because of my particular context. If the Quran were being revealed today uh, to God's prophet in this context, it would show knowledge of this particular context. So now, with uh, just a few minutes remaining, uh, let me uh, look at some of the other uh, problems regarding the, um, the idea of whether God is one person or, or three persons. James has um, given us some examples of how the New Testament writers um, are, are taking passages that refer to Yahweh, and now they're referring to Jesus in the New Testament. And lo and behold, that means that the New Testament writers are taking Jesus as Yahweh. But then, why, why doesn't anyone in the New Testament give you a simple declarative statement saying, Jesus is Yahweh? Why don't they do that? They're not doing that because they cannot get to that stage. In their minds, that would be wrong to say. But something is stimulating them to say, well, Jesus is like Yahweh. Why would they say that? I mentioned Paul before. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.24 that uh, Jesus is the power and wisdom of God. So what Paul is thinking is that the wisdom of God somehow became Jesus. The power of God somehow became Jesus. Some attributes of God now are in Jesus. So they're, they're not thinking that Jesus is actually God. They're thinking that Jesus is a, a figure that is subordinate to God, but somehow he shares some of the attributes with God. Yes, it is sure, but it is not Trinity. This is not saying that Jesus is God. For this to be Trinity, Jesus has to be God. But Paul is very clear. Jesus is subordinate to God, and he will remain so to the very end. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 28 says that in the end game, this is what will happen. Jesus will surrender everything to God so that God will be all in all. So Jesus will remain subordinate. In fact, the idea of subordination is so strong in, in the Bible that recently a number of evangelical Christians have put together a volume of essays. Half of the essays approximately support a subordinationist view. Which means that evangelicals who subscribe to the doctrine of the Trinity are nonetheless saying that within the Trinity there is an eternal subordination of the Son to the Father. But I think that the subordination of the Son to the Father actually proves, I, I didn't realize I was going over time, actually proves that there is no such thing as a Trinity. There is only one God, one person. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Owen. Uh, Dr. James White, we now give you 10 minutes of love. Well, while the words are still ringing in your ears, the reason Jesus did not cry out to Yahweh is he was quoting Psalm 22, verse 1, which doesn't contain the name. So he would have to misquote the text to do it the way that Shabir was doing it. Just look up Hebrews, uh, I'm sorry, Psalm 22 verse 1, and you will discover that the word Yahweh is not used in the section that Jesus was quoting. So that's pretty obvious. Now, there are numerous uh, issues to try to, uh, to try to get to, and very, very little period of time to do so. It is an odd in a debate. You have a 20-minute opening statement, and half the time to respond to the point, so it actually takes you at least two or three times the amount of time. So you, have to, you have to pick, and you have to choose. Now, some of the problems we have here is I didn't really get a, a, a clear understanding. I think Shabir said that the reason that the author of the Quran does not show as much knowledge of Christianity is because in the context that the Quran is being written, that wasn't necessary. Except that the, the context in which the Quran was being written included, for example, the meeting of Muhammad with the Christians from Najran, which then becomes a part of Surah 3. There was all sorts of interaction there. And they already believed all these things. All the Christological controversies were already a thing in the past at this particular point in time. So the reality is, let's, let's back up and look at the whole story. We have a book that is barely half the length of the New Testament. 
that never quotes from the Old and New Testaments showing literary dependence in any way, that comes along and says what everybody believes and has been decided about Jesus in regards to his relationship with the Father, if you believe that, you're going to hell. But this book does not give any meaningful uh, evidence of understanding of anything Paul wrote, anything John wrote. Uh, the, the author of the Quran had no earthly concept of people saying that Second Peter wasn't written by Peter, even though Second Peter had an amanuensis, someone who wrote it down, which is, uh, we can get into that, that's another completely different subject. Doesn't have any knowledge of anything like that, doesn't raise any of those issues, because the author of the Quran never heard of First or Second Peter. And by the way, the fact that the New Testament writers know that books exist outside of the Old Testament canon and quote from them, or quote from secular works, is not the same thing in any way, shape, or form as the fact that there is that much evidence that the author of the Quran had any knowledge whatsoever of what the canon of the New Testament was. The authors of the New Testament knew what the canon of the Old Testament was. They knew the law and the prophets. They knew the writings. They knew exactly what they made reference to them numerous times. There's nothing like that in the Quran at all. We don't even know what Injil refers to in the Quran. Even though we're told it is perspicuous, it is mubinu, but no, it does not tell us these things in any way, shape, or form. So, we still have to ask the question, why should we abandon what was written in the first century by the followers of Jesus and accept what is written by someone 600 years later in a different language who gives us absolutely, positively no reason to believe that he is interacting with the material that we have believed from the eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus in the first place. Why should we do that? And would Muslims accept a book that comes 600 years after Muhammad, shows no knowledge of what, of what Muhammad taught or believed, but told you all to stop following him and believe something else? Would you be consistent at that particular point in time, is the question. And so I think it's extremely important, and when, when, uh, when we are told, well, you know, Surah, Chat, Surah Fat, uh, should be quoted to, it says, well, what God has revealed in the Gospel. So Surah Fat is actually telling Christians to engage in some sort of redaction criticism of their Gospels, to try to figure out what it, that is there is still from God and what isn't. Is that what Surah Fat is talking about? Or is a real reading of the historical context? Isn't it interesting? Well, the, the Quran isn't going to go into that type of detail because of its historical context it's only doing with these people. But, on the other hand, Surah 5 actually means that the Christians are supposed to be doing in-depth redaction criticism uh, based upon modern concepts as to what's still part of the gospel that was sent down by God and what isn't. A, a reading of Surah 5, verses 44 through and following is going to very clearly mean, you Christians, you have the gospel, believe and judge by what it says. We know what they had. They were not engaging in redaction criticism that time. And so to be consistent, they would be to be judged by what was in the scriptures that they had, which are the same scriptures that we have today as well. Now, a, a reference was made to a, a website, Jesus' Words Only. I would, I would like to, a thought experiment, would that make any sense at all? Of course not. Because Jesus makes reference to the scriptures, he makes reference to the scriptures that came before him, he makes reference to his disciples, he makes reference to the coming church, he leaves all sorts of things unexplained because he knows he doesn't have to explain everything because the church is going to be found, the spirit is going to come, he even talks about the coming of the spirit, which is not Muhammad, though, because he's going to dwell within the, the individuals and the believers themselves that he's talking to at that point in time. So, Jesus' words only would be utterly incomprehensible by Jesus' own testimony. Think about John chapter 10. He refers people back to Psalm 82. You've got to know what Psalm 82 is about to even understand what Jesus is saying. So, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever to make that kind of an argument uh, at all. So, uh, when I quoted N.T. Wright, by the way, what I was emphasizing was not that we don't know who wrote the Gospels. I disagree with him on that. We don't know the order in which they were written or when they were written. That was actually what I was referring to when I talked about N.T. Wright at that particular point in time. And believe you me, the writers of the New Testament 
well knew what the divine name was. They are not ignorant of the divine name in the way that Muhammad and the Quran is ignorant of the divine name. That's why they can actually specifically utilize texts that were about Yahweh and apply them to Jesus in a specific fashion. Of course they knew what the divine name was. Yes, they used. The, the, the people that they're writing to, they're writing in Greek. So what Bible are they going to quote from? Hebrew? No, they're going to quote from the Greek. And the Greek used kodios. So they use that. But they know what the divine name is. And, that, and folks, listen to this. Think about the book of Acts. What do the early Christians do? They consider it to be a fantastic thing, an honor to do what? To suffer for the name. Who's the name of suffering? Jesus. Now, they, re they, they do not see themselves as some new religion. They are the fulfillment. So if Jesus becomes the name they suffer for, if Jesus is the name given above every name, in the name of Jesus every knee bows, every tongue confesses, and yet they quote... Paul quotes from the Shema, the prayer that defines the Jewish people, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. He quotes that in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, but he expands it out to include the Father and the Son. Can you imagine including a mere prophet in the description of God in the Shema as Paul does? I don't have time to expand upon that right now. I did, in a debate with Shapiro, I did. Um, in South Africa, uh, one of the earliest followers of Jesus was God. I would recommend that you take a look at the, because uh, we had all sorts of projection and all sorts of neat fun stuff like that. At that particular point in time, I would suggest that you take a look at, at, at that. Now finally, we had a demand. Why don't we have the specific phrase, Jesus is Yahweh? Uh, you know, uh, Ahmed Dida used to say, nowhere in the Bible does Jesus say, I am God, worship me, as if that is actually a reasonable argument. It is not a reasonable argument. If the writings communicate the reality, you don't have to use a specific phrase to get to that reality. If you have the author of the Carmen Christi in Philippians chapter 2 specifically applying Isaiah 45, 23 to Jesus, Think it through in the context. If you have Psalm 102, 25, 27 being applied to Jesus, in a very chapter where Jesus is described as the one through whom everything has been created, figure out what it's talking about. You can see exactly what is being communicated. And so, we have the revelation that is found in the incarnation and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. 600 years later, someplace else, someone who's never read any of those documents says, I'm not going there. That's what we're facing this evening. That's the issue that we are, that we are dealing with this evening. That's why we have to recognize and deal with these subjects and recognize the difference between the nature of the New Testament and the nature of the Quran. That's what our conversation is about. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. White. Dr. Ali, your rebuttal. Yeah, and this time I'll pay more attention to that, to that clock. So, very quickly, <laughs> folks, uh, thank you for uh, your um, active engagement, James. I really enjoy listening to you and taking notes uh, to prepare to, to respond to your specific questions. And I'm so glad that you're still uh, so lively here tonight. Well, um, James is asking, well, I'm uh, 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 saying that because Jesus was quoting Psalm 22, that's why he didn't mention the divine name. But look at all the words of Jesus throughout the New Testament. Well, uh, did he have any chance to quote any other passage where Yahweh's name is mentioned, so that he could mention Yahweh? Uh, and, and why on the cross did he actually mention Yahweh? Why did he pick up a, name, a, a passage that has a different name, when Yahweh said in the Old Testament, this is going to be my name forever, uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse number 15, it looks like the New Testament portrays Jesus himself as not actually following the Old Testament, which itself is a problem, because if for Jesus to be legitimate, he has to follow the Old Testament. And notice what James is, is, uh, is saying about the prophet Muhammad. Why should we follow a prophet who came 600 years after the, the Bible is already completed? So Muhammad is being judged against the Bible which is already completed before him. But let's do that for Paul before Muhammad. 
Paul has to be judged against the words and teachings of Jesus. That's where the words of Jesus only comes in. Not that the words of Jesus only take out of context or make all sense, but that they should be given priority. And if Jesus says one thing and Paul says the other, Jesus stays and Paul goes. And then Jesus has to be evaluated based on the same principle. Because the Old Testament existed before him as a scripture from God, and he, he has to conform to the scripture that is already from God. Otherwise, as David Klinghoffer uh, writes in his book, Why the Jews Rejected Jesus, the Jews would have reason to reject it. In fact, our Christian friends claim uh, that, uh, they, they, that the, the Jews were picking up stones to stone Jesus because he was claiming to be God. Well, why were they picking up? Because they said, we have a law that, that says that's what we have to do. Who gave them that law? God gave them the law. So now, you have the odd situation that God gave them a law that says that if a man comes to you and claims to be God, you stone him uh, to death, and they're just carrying out God's law. It's as if God wants to die, and he sets up the Jews to kill him, and then take the blame for that. And obviously there are problems all over the place if you follow uh, the Christian line of argument here. Uh, but what is simpler is to recognize uh, that Jesus, on whom we peace, was in fact a follower of the Old Testament law. He himself was a human being, and uh, he... Uh, did not claim to be God himself, and so uh, there is no such thing as a trinity. God is only one person, and uh, not three. Uh, it, James says, well, Peter had an amanuensis. That's why, you know, that answers the pseudonymity problem, but of course, Christian scholars have gone through this, and uh, they have concluded generally that Second Peter is not written by Peter, so the problem of pseudonymity um, uh, remains. Uh, so, why accept a book that's come 600 years later? Because this book is actually calling Christians back to the Old Testament and to the teachings of Jesus. The Old Testament in Yeshima says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Jesus, of whom we peace, in Mark chapter 12, verse number 27 to 29, uh, shows that uh, Jesus uh, repeated the same Shema as the greatest commandment. As the greatest commandment. You know what the later gospel writers did with this? They omitted the statement of Jesus, the Shema. Why did they do that? Because Christianity was heading away from the teachings of Jesus and towards Trinitarian doc doctrine a step at a time, one gospel after another. The gospel according to John was quoted from early on, where uh, James says, well, Isaiah saw his glory. Well, the Gospel according to John, by most scholars' count, uh, is, is the last of the four Gospels to be written. And James himself, in his book, The Forgotten Trinity, has said that James had more time to reflect on these things. That's why it comes out more plainly in, 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 in John's Gospel. Because John had more time to reflect. That's why it's not so clear in, in Mark. That's clear in John. Well, what is happening here is that there is an evolution of the Christian faith. And the evolution goes through the Gospels. The, the, you find that uh, Mark, the earliest of the four Gospels, shows Jesus to have limitations in his knowledge and his power. For example, when uh, Mark has Jesus say that he does not know when the hour will occur. So if there's one thing that the Father knows, that is the hour, and the Son doesn't know it, that shows that the Son, son is not the omniscient God, and therefore the Trinity does not actually exist. God is only one person, not to read. So that's why we should accept the book that came 600 years later, because it's actually calling us back to the original faith of Moses and Jesus and all the great uh, prophets. In fact, the rest of the New Testament writers, or we should say many of them, because we don't know all of them and all of their minds and whether in fact they were monotheists or not, but some of them did actually make explicit statements. Paul himself uh, said, uh, there is no God but one, in the very passage that James was actually quoting. And then he goes on to say, for us there is only one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. Okay, so he did something with the Shema here that requires some discussion, but it is very clear that for him there is only one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. So there is a hierarchy here according to him. And, and he explains this in so many other passages. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, that the head of every woman is her husband, the head of every man is Christ, the head of Christ is God. So there's a hierarchy with, unfortunately, the women below, I don't agree with that, but that's what Paul says. 
and then men all the way, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 men above women and Christ above men and God above Christ. So there's a hierarchy here. Now the same thing we find in John's Gospel. John's Gospel has Jesus as the law. Because that too is an innovation. Because the law was, uh, this was not mentioned in the previous three Gospels. Only in the Gospel according to John. Actually, obviously, as a, reflect, as a, a, a result of later reflection, right? So, John came to this understanding that Jesus is the lawless of God. Another attribute of God, similar to wisdom, or maybe the same thing as wisdom, nobody knows for sure. Uh, and if it's uh, two different things, then it would mean that Jesus is two different things. He's the wisdom according to Paul, he's the lawless according to John. Okay? If there's one thing, then it's less of a problem, but we're still in the same ballpark of showing that for Paul and Jesus, and for Paul and John, Jesus is a subordinate figure to God. He shares something of the attributes of God, but John has Jesus plainly say, the Father is greater than I. John chapter 14, verse 28. So there's a hierarchy. And John actually does not call uh, the, the Logos God uh, as, as an identifier, but according to Daniel Wallace, when it says, and the Word was God, that's a quali qualitative statement. So the, the Word was Divine is the best translation, but he says, no, I won't use that translation because today people call all kinds of things divine. Even like a good meal, people will say this is a divine meal. But if, that, if you want to say that, then, then, then don't say divine uh, God, divine uh, Holy Spirit, or anything. Nothing is really, use a different word. But that's the word that John used to show that the Holy, that this logos is divine, but it's not the Almighty God. In, in John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus himself prays that they may know you as the only true God, and Jesus, your messenger, as Christ. So he makes a distinction between the only true God and himself. So that's why you should follow the Quran that came 600 years later, because it's calling you back to that original faith, which came, became lost uh, through all of the creeds that developed uh, later on. Uh, now, is the Quran telling Christians to engage in redaction criticism? Uh, well, not 1,400 years ago, because that would not have been possible. But the Quran accepted Christians as they are, utilizing their knowledge and whatever intellect and capacity God had given them to the best of their abilities. Whatever they arrived at, the Quran actually treats Christians with respect and actually speaks about them respectfully, calls them Abu Kita, people of the book, which means that they're educated people. Uh, the Quran says that God has placed love in the hearts of those who follow Jesus, which is, as you know, the love commandment. Christians are very good with that. Muslims can learn something from that. And so the, the Quran praises and respects Christians as they are. But I would say that the onus is on somebody like my friend James, because he has the capacity to engage in redaction criticism. But he's not listening to his colleagues and other great scholars who are actually doing that today. And he's not listening to his own words because if he looks at that, what he has said about John's Gospel and really thinks about it, well, the later the Gospel, the more they reflected, the more they said things. Well, why didn't the earlier Gospel writers know this? So if the earlier Gospel writers and other writers of the New Testament were not clear about the Trinity, then they could be committing all kinds of heresies in their own minds. Uh, James has explained in his book, The Forgotten Trinity, how easy it is to fall into a heresy. And, and, and uh, some of these may have fallen into heresy while writing the New Testament scriptures. May God save them and save all of us. That's all my time. I'll speak with you some more later on. Thank you very much. Uh, a question uh, you just referring to first Corinthians chapter 8 uh, and you said that even in that text I hadn't looked at it close enough because Paul still differentiates between the Father and the Son you've read the Forgotten Trinity right? yes Okay. And so you know that in the doctrine of the Trinity we differentiate between the Father and the Son I do and in fact, uh, we believe that the Son voluntarily um, 
comes to earth, that he is sent by the Father and takes over the world, right? I know you believe that. Okay, so, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, when Paul utilizes the language of the Shema in the Greek translation, and he says, one Lord, familiar with Andre Gordon, mm -hmm. that's the term kudios, right? Mm -hmm. In Deuteronomy, when the Shema is found there, what does Kurios represent? Uh, well, of course, the Shema is in, is in Hebrew. Um, right. Uh, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Echad. And they translated the term Kurios, which Paul uses of Jesus, is translated which one of those Hebrew words? Paul Kurios. But the Hebrew words, what Hebrew word is Yahweh. that? Yeah. Yahweh, yes. Yeah. So, if Paul is quoting the Shema, and he says there's one God, the Father. That would be Elohim, right? The term Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Elohim, right? It's not clear what, what Paul is referring to in terms of the wording of the Shema. Uh, but the, the outcome of what Paul is saying is that there is one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. And the term Kurios there is in reference to Yahweh in Deuteronomy, right? You can't be sure what's in the mind of Paul. You can only read what he has written. You can't say that Paul used this word to refer to that Hebrew word because he's not saying, this is my dictionary of words, Yahweh equals this. He's saying that we, for us, there is only one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. If you want to make that uh, connection by saying, oh, Kurios here is referring to uh, this particular word in the Shema, that, that's, that's your equation. But Paul is saying, for us, there is only one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. He has done something different. He's saying something different than the Shema. The Shema says that there is only one Lord God. Uh, but Paul is saying one Lord and one God. Uh, that, that, that's what he's saying. But, but, but you're saying that Lord is lesser than God. In what Paul is saying, because he's saying there is only one God uh, who is is the ultimate, and Jesus is the one through whom God makes everything. So you believe that because the prepositions are used there, that somehow lessens Jesus, even though the same prepositions are used in Father, elsewhere, and elsewhere. It's, it's, not the prep, it's not the prepositions, James. It's the whole concept that Paul is... is well, you said through him. That's a preposition, isn't it? it? Yes, but it's not the preposition alone. That's He's okay. saying, okay. he is differentiating, okay. look, that there is only... If, if we say... Um, uh, this morning, uh, Donald Trump met with the President of the United States of America. It makes no sense, because he is the President of the United States of America. Yes, you're and, assuming you're saying this, but, okay, but I'm not. Uh, but, but it, now, if there are two persons who are, who are God, if there are two persons who are God, the Father is God, the Son is God, it makes no sense to say there is one God the Father and one Lord Jesus Christ. Well, uh, because now, the, the natural question is, why don't you say uh, there are two persons who are God, or, or three persons who are God. The Father is one of them. Uh, Jesus is one of them. Why, why use the term God only for one, but not for the other? So, it is. So you you reject the idea that the normative term that Paul uses for the Father is Hathaos, and the normative term he uses for Jesus is Hathaos. You don't believe that? I'm not, I'm not denying that, but I'm saying that this means okay. that in Paul's mind, there is only one who is called God, and that is the Father. And, and Jesus is called but, Lord, which is a glorified so, title. So I don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to belabor this, but I think it's extremely important, because it is excruciatingly clear that Paul is quoting from the Greek Septuagint of the Shema in Deuteronomy, in, in 1 Corinthians 8. You call that quoting? Yes. He's using the exact same words. I put it all on the screen. We debated uh, in South Africa with, with all the things. You know, I, I wish I could, could, could put it up right now because I can prove this. If he is quoting the Shema, was he not identifying Jesus as Yahweh? Well, he wasn't quoting the Shema. He, he, he okay. has in mind the Shema, obviously, but the Shema doesn't say for us. Uh, this, he, that's Paul's own wording. And, and the Shema does not include all of that, you know, through whom all things are made and so on. That's Paul's own wording. So he is using words from the Shema, and he's filling it out in his own way. 
and, and separating things in his own way. But the result in, from what Paul is writing is very clear. There is only one God, the Father, and there is one Lord, Jesus Christ. So we have a God and we have a Lord. But, but there is only one God. And he just finished saying, there is no God but one. Is it not true that both God and Lord, both the same terms, are used of the one God, Yahweh, in the Greek subject, in the Shema? Was that confusing to Moses? Let me hear a question again. So, the term Eloheinu, God, mm -hmm. and Yahweh, Lord, are both, Kurios, are both used in the Shema of the one God. Correct. So, Here, Moses can differentiate the terms without confusion. And when Paul does in light of the incarnation, somehow he doesn't get to do that? Well, the difference is that Paul is not using the exact words. To begin with, he's not using the exact Hebrew. He's using he, he's translating it in his own way. And it's not even the translation. He has actually split it up. So you know, Yahweh Elohimu, Yahweh Echad, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one, which is one so in the Greek if you translate Yahweh as the Lord in the Greek Septuagint as it is, then you have it something like uh, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. So the Lord of our God, the Lord is one. So there is only one Lord God, to put it in a very simple uh, and, and, and precise manner. So could, could, could Paul have taken those words and applied them to the Muslim Jesus, who is merely a prophet? No, I said that. This is sure. But Paul has so said it is sure. It is sure. But it's not sure. Trinity. But it's not Trinity either. So, so, so it's, 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 a, it's a lesser sure, but it's still sure from your perspective. It is sure, but it's not Trinity. How about, how about, how about in Philippians chapter 2, quoting Isaiah 45, 23, applying it to Jesus? Is that sure? Every well, knee will bow, every tongue confess? Uh, look at the ending. It says, to the, the glory, glory of God, God the Father. Yes. So, to, to, for, for Paul, Which is for Jesus, Jesus is like, um, you know, the it's at his name every uh, knee should bow. It's like we hear the name Jesus. Okay, so we bow. But who are we bowing to? To the glory of God the Father, not to Jesus himself. We hear his name and we bow to the glory of God the Father. I'm not saying Muslims should do this. And I'm so, not saying there's nothing so wrong with right. it. Okay. But I'm saying that this is not Trinity. So you're actually saying that at the name of Jesus, instead of bowing to Jesus, you're bowing to somebody else, is what Paul intended in Philippians chapter 2. Even though he's committing shirk over in 1 Corinthians 8. Again, I'm not saying that I know the mind of Paul, but I'm saying, looking at the writing, the writing is not telling us to bow to Jesus. The writing is telling us to bow to the glory of God. And so, and can you give me some interpreters that actually go that way? Well, these are the plain words. It's, no, I don't think the plain words are just opposite, but you, can you give us any, anyway? Yes, I, in fact, I just... Uh, oh, well, yeah, the Unitarians, yeah. <laughs> yes. I know the Unitarians, I'm sure, are going to go the same direction. <laughs> okay, so uh, right. So you you then said uh, you you made a uh, when I explained you you rather loudly repeated the Aramaic for Psalm twenty two, right? And then you said, well, why would why why would Jesus quote Psalm twenty two? Could he have misquoted it? Do, do, I'm, I'm trying to understand what you're, I do not understand what your, your position I, I was, was. I was responding to your point that Jesus did not mention Yahweh because the Psalm 22 did not mention right. Yahweh in that verse. Right. So I'm saying that he had other options. He could mention another verse that has Yahweh. If not on the cross, okay. he could have mentioned it somewhere throughout his life. But, but will you admit all? that the Psalm 22 citation probably wasn't the best one to go to? Are you, are you saying that I should admit that Psalm 22 was not the best citation? If you if you're trying to if you're trying to say that Jesus didn't use Yahweh, Psalm 22 is not where you want to go. Do you why, why do you think Jesus said Eloi Eloi Lama Sabachthani? Some interpreters say that this was a reference to the entire psalm, right? And he's just giving you the beginning. And, and what's the entire psalm about? Well, it shows that uh, somebody is in distress, deeply distressed, <laughs> calling out to God for help. And God will help them and save them from that distress. Do you see it as a messianic song? <coughs> no. Dividing my garments, piercing my hands, that has nothing to do with perspective. It, it has can't, not, it can't from, well, it can from your perspective because you don't hold, you, you still hold the, uh, the view that Jesus was crucified, but that he didn't die. Well, if that requires some explanation. It's a different topic, but I want to get well, well, to I know, but in a second, kind of too, on whether it's a messianic song. And they, they, uh, Christ, today, Christians think, oh, this is exactly about the crucifixion. 
But what you need to recognize is that the New Testament writers wrote about the crucifixion by borrowing wording from that psalm. So they, they didn't go around to ask the eyewitnesses what actually happened at the crucifixion in this uh, respect, but they took the wording from the psalm. And, and the psalm used to say in, uh, that they pierced my hands, but the, the Hebrew uh, earlier text that were discovered shows that they're at my hands like, like wolves or, or something like wild animals. So it's not about piercing at all. Uh, so it's, it's not really, uh, this is not a messianic psalm. You, you, you have some correction to that, I'd be glad to hear. Uh, I was, are you not aware of the fact that, in fact, the Masoretic has tearing my hands, but they have now found Masoretic texts in Quran that had piercing. You had it. You sound like you present that backwards. I could be corrected on that. Yeah. So, so they have found it in the Hebrew, and it's certainly in, in the Greek. Uh, I just, <laughs> so, my very quickly, Jesus. What what is the problem? I say that Jesus quotes the twenty second Psalm because he's saying to he quotes the beginning of it because he's saying to everyone, "This is being fulfilled in me right now." You don't believe that? You know, could that could that not have happened? Well, there are many problems with having Jesus uh, just uh, read the opening lines of this song, because uh, this is referred to as a prior derivation. Uh, on the surface, it makes uh, Muslims wonder, how could this be God? And he's calling out to God. In fact, in fact, everybody should wonder, why is he calling out to God if he himself is God? So from the, from the get-go, it shows that this is not a God on the cross. Okay, This is a God, somebody dependent on God. Okay, but, but, but right there, do you realize that's not an objection from the Christian religion? Because you have kenosis, Jesus. Because he is, himself, and he's, he's truly, if he's truly the God-man, he is about to become a sacrifice for sin. He who has eternally been pure and holy is about to take on the wrath of the Father on behalf of his people their sin. You don't think that he could quote the 22nd Psalm and say, look at what happens in the 22nd Psalm. I will be justified, because that's what happens to the Psalms. Well, the justification uh, is that this person will be saved from his distress. Yes. And, and that would support the Muslim view that Jesus wasn't actually finally killed on the cross, but he was actually saved from this distress. Okay, so, so you're saying mm -hmm. that an interpretation would come 600 years later would be a more likely interpretation than the one that would have suggested itself in the first century, which was based upon the fact that every single one of the Gospel writers is now going to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus? Well, and they, it's... <laughs> You say it would have suggested itself in the first century, but the first century writers overlooked certain things. They quoted Psalm 45 and made that refer to Jesus, but Psalm 45 is uh, according to uh, um, Dara Locke in, in this book, New Testament Use of the Old Testament. Uh, Psalm 45 is about it's a wedding song about a king who gets married to a queen. Of course, Jesus, we all know that. And Jesus wasn't that. So what they did was they, they so, so you're overlooked saying... certain things. And they applied what they wanted. So they overlooked the fact that this psalm actually shows that the person who's crying out to God would actually be saved by God. So you can apply you can apply John 14 and 16, Muhammad, which had nothing to do about the prophet coming 600 years later. But if we look at a wedding psalm and Jesus recognizes the scripture contains within it pictures of what's coming, that's invalid. Okay, now, I, wouldn't change the standard? I wouldn't change the subject now to talk about John, John chapter 16 in reference to the well, We can uh, direct people to our, our debate on that. In love, however, right? however I, will, I, will, I will deal with it from this perspective. John chapter 16 uh, is, is the uh, place in, in the New Testament that most clearly attributes personal qualities to the Holy Spirit. And uh, many commentators on the Bible who are not Muslim and who have not been Muslim Great commentators have said that this initially was a saying that referred to a male salafitic figure to come after Jesus. Now, I'm not saying Muhammad, not in this debate, that's a different topic. But, but now, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing it back at you, but, but I'm throwing it back to you. If you think I'm saying Muhammad, while I'm quoting the words of Christian scholars, no, but then that's not the point. That's the point. You got, no, you, you, it's not the point I'm making, but you see the connection. There was a male salafitic Figure. This is what Christian scholars have said. But now, if this is true, that this was a male salvific figure and not the Holy Spirit, then we have a problem in that uh, the Holy Spirit is not clearly shown to be a person that is distinct from the Father and the Son in the New Testament. And therefore, the Trinity also fails on that count. After your wife? Uh, Dr. Ali, you may now ask questions for Dr. White. Okay. 
So, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. White, uh, so uh, you, you have the kenosis which you refer to, and I want to come back to that. So, uh, Jesus emptied himself of divinity, is that what you would say? Okay, so he was still absolutely divine. Yes. And he must have had two minds then, a human mind and a divine mind. No. He had one mind. Well, he is a he is one person. One person. We, we, we need to understand that when we talk about the incarnation, uh, we do believe that Jesus Christ is one person with two natures. So he is absolutely unique. There is no one to whom we can compare him. And your term, your use of the term kenosis, I'm not sure what you mean by that. It's only used that one time in Philippians chapter two. Uh, but while there are things that Jesus's glory, for example, is veiled during the incarnation. He lays certain things aside so he functions in the sun. He does not cease to be God. What certain things did he lay aside? Well, for example, his glory. Jesus didn't glow when he walked down the streets of Jerusalem. Uh, it would have been nice at night, but uh, <laughs> that's not something that he did. So, but, so while he was glorious, as as John says in John 12 41, Isaiah saw his glory and he spoke about him. He was glorious. That had been veiled, and in reference to the, the day or the hour. Uh, that knowledge was veiled during the time of the Incarnation. It wouldn't be something that would be veiled after that. It would only be things that would be relevant to Jesus being able to function in doing the will of the Father, which was what? To lay his life down to his people. Okay. So now, you subscribe to the principle of sola scriptura. Mm -hmm. Scripture alone. Um, scripture so, alone is the sole infallible rule of authority of the mm -hmm. That does not mean we do not have confessions. Of okay. So how do you know that this is the only thing that Jesus laid aside, his knowledge of the hour? I didn't say that that was the only thing. I, I, you asked for, for examples of categories of things. So there was a, there was a submission to the Father. There, was, there, were, there were some other things that you might be able Whatever would hinder Jesus from doing what the Father desired him to do would be something that would be laid aside. But his divine nature, which is what we start out with, is not something that is, is like something. Yeah. So, the, so the very statement, uh, whatever would have hindered him for, from carrying out uh, the whatever the Father commanded him to do, that is not a, a scriptural statement. That's an inference that you have. Like yes, of course. Confession. So yes, you're asking questions. Yeah. You're not, not not asking scripture, and therefore you have to then reason from the basis of scripture. Okay, good. That's not a violation of soul. Okay. Sure. I'm understand, I'm, I'm understanding. Um. Wrote a book on it. I thought I'd give it to you. I, I read it, but still, <laughs> <laughs> I, I read the book. I can't, I can't keep track of which books I've given you. Yeah. You need to give me a list of them. Thank you. Thank you for all of these. <laughs> um, I'm still waiting on your book. Say again? I'm still waiting on your books. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> now, um, to continue then, and so, so and while you laid aside uh, certain aspects and certain aspects of his knowledge, um, he nonetheless retain his divine mind. Yes. So he knew that he was God, like from beginning to end. He's in the womb of Mary, but he knows, I'm, I'm God, and I'm here in the womb of Mary. Well, the exact relationship of uh, the divine and human and Jesus, just like what was, what was Jesus like when he was a four-year-old, are things that Scripture did not reveal to us. And, in fact, uh, that's what the Gnostics got into, speculation. What we need to know is given to us. What we don't need to know, we do not speculate. But you just said that you do actually speculate because you have creeds and confessions. In response, have... to, in response to certain questions yes. that would have an impact upon specific statements made in Scripture. For example, Jesus has to be who he said he was to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Then, obviously, at that point, we can draw a line. But I can go beyond that into all sorts of things. Like, okay. how did Jesus... Behave with other children. That is, that's what the Gnostics got into. Sure, sure. sure. I and mean, of course, that depends on some historical uh, records that we don't have. So I'm not going to ask you uh, silly things like that. But I'm going to ask you, Good. like logically, um, Jesus must have had a human brain. We would certainly hope so. Yes, and therefore a human mind. In that sense, and he also had the divine mind. Well, now you're now you're now you're taking uh, something that is. Does does God have a human brain? I have a mind. So, so you're taking something that is divine that is not connected with physicality and paralleling it with something that would be necessary for Jesus to be truly human. So those are two different categories. 
I, I, I lost you there. So if, for Jesus to be truly human, he had to have a human mind. True? Yes, he had. Okay. He, was, he was a fully man. Yeah. But that doesn't, when you, when you talk about a brain, now you're, now you're getting into, into something that's physical, and then you turn it around and attribute it to God. No, well, no, I'm attributing this to the human Jesus. I'm saying the human Jesus must have had a human mind mm -hmm. and, and a human brain from the basis of this mind. Well, his body moved, so he doesn't have a brain. Okay, so he had a brain and a human mind. It's a human brain and a human mind. But, but he also had the divine mind. You just told me that he had... See, see that's, as soon as you say divine mind, you're paralleling that with the human mind based upon a brain, which I, which I don't... Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not connecting okay, the, human mind, the divine mind to the brain. Yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah. there, there is a divine mind, true? God is, let's say, okay, it's not there, but God exists, and God has... God is aware of his existence, has his plans, he's communicative, and in fact, we're made in his image, which is the only reason we are able to worship him and communicate with him, yes. Okay, and we can speak of the mind of God, yes? In the sense of his revelation of his will. Okay. So, something of God is in Jesus, but that's not a mind? No, it's not described as a mind. It's, it's not a, a person. As a person. He's, 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 he's the eternal Logos, the second person of the Trinity. Okay, so this eternal Logos, second person of the Holy Trinity, is not a mind. He's not, he's not just a mind. Okay, so he's a mind plus more. <laughs> Again, I, 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 I don't know what, what you want me to use well, the term mind for, because that's not so in James, you have to think about this, because this actually would be a very important uh, um, problem for the, uh, to, to be solved. If Jesus uh, is to be God, he has to have uh, a divine mind, otherwise he's not God. But to be human, he has to have a human mind, otherwise he wouldn't be human. And the human mind cannot think I'm God, nor can the divine mind uh, not know that he is divine. No. So you have two problem. minds. The problem you have here is, is you're, you're trying to conflate two different things together. You're, you're making the error what's historically known as Eutychianism, where you have a mixture of the two. Uh, the, the early church was very, very, very focused upon this, and that's why it was called the hypostatic union. Eutychianism, which you're suggesting, um, Nestorianism and Apollinarianism were all rejected as errors here. And when you try to positively identify how you have the human and the divine joined in Jesus without changing each one fundamentally into something else, we cannot answer questions about that for one simple reason. He's unique. There's nothing, there's absolutely nothing to, to compare it to. Instead, we can only describe it. And how did Paul describe it? I'm sorry, I should have asked you a question. <laughs> Paul described it. If the rulers had known, they would not have not crucified the Lord of glory. Now, crucifixion is something that only can be done to a physical body. But the Lord of glory can't be crucified. So Paul speaks of Jesus in such a fashion that he identifies his eternal nature as the Lord of glory, but also recognizes he took on human flesh. So he describes it, but he doesn't answer every question that could possibly be asked about brains and minds and things like that. Now, on, on your website, uh, you have a statement of faith in which you say that uh, the, the Trinity is uh, uh, the relationship between the three persons. That the relationship between the three persons is described by the word Trinity or the doctrine of the can you tell us in your own words how you say that? Well, I, I, in the Forgotten Trinity, right toward the beginning, I give, give the definition within the one being that is God. They're eternally, co-eternal. There exists eternally three co-eternal persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father. And we differentiate between the words being and person. So probably that's what's in the, the way we're referring to on the website. Yeah, I'm asking you because this word, word relation came up there, and I know that there is a dispute among Christians today as to whether Trinity is uh, just a relationship between three persons, in which case uh, some people say this amounts to tritheism. That would be true. Yeah, okay. So, if, you, if you limited it just to, to some concept of relationship, well, they're not denying that there is a, that there are specific signs of relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and I think yeah. that's what you're referring to. Your presentation, I think you were talking about the internal subordination of the Sun controversy from a couple of years ago. That's a different controversy. Right. Uh, 
okay, but that is what you're referring to. No, I'm referring to another one where if you have, uh, if, let's say you have one god who manifests himself in three different ways, like you showed with the light box. So uh, everybody knows this is only one god, he looks differently at different times, but it's just the one god. And um, of course, you might have a different problem with that. Uh, but uh, if you say that uh, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, what keeps them together as a unity? Now, obviously, there's a relationship among them. Augustine spoke about love, and he was speaking about the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit would be the love between them. Uh, so that's not really the trinity that's classically defined, because in that case, love would not be a person. So you could have only two persons and the love between them. Now, if you have three persons, what's holding them together as, as, a, as a unity? Their entire existence is found in the being of God. They, we, we do not believe being of God can be divided up into parts. So Jesus isn't one third of God, and the Father one third of God. There is one being of God, infinite, eternal, Yahweh, shared by three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So they would cease to exist as a person without being. The being is the divine being. Mm -hmm. So unlike you and I, our being is limited. Uh, to, to time and space, we're creatures. God's being is not limited to time and space. And so can be shared by, and is revealed in Scripture, be shared by three divine persons, and not four, because Scripture doesn't give any indication. But you just told me that there's a being, and there are three persons, uh, three divine persons, and who share that one and being. differentiate between being and person. So, but there are cannot, so you cannot put being in the same category as person and come up with four. Can, can you pray, or, or do, do Christians pray to the Holy Spirit? They can. Okay. Do they? Well, yes. Okay. So I know that they, the Lord... I mean, I'm sure there's some that do not, but I, yeah. you can. I mean, it's, okay. it's by the... It's normally... The Spirit, right now, takes from the things of Christ and testifies to them. So He is not the focus, according to the Bible's own testimony, of what His current role is right now. When all things are wrapped up and God is all in all, then you'll have equality in regards to that, that worship. But then we'll have equality in terms of worship. So, are you saying that? Uh, yeah, right now you have the economy of salvation. You have their redemptions being worked out right now. God is still calling His elect people, and so there is a focus upon Jesus. The Spirit indwells us and directs us to Him, and through Him, worship to the Father. But someday, this is all going to be wrapped up, thankfully, uh, and Jesus will be victor over all things. So the, the, the Father is obviously a spirit, because in, in John uh, chapter 4, it's teaching me to the smart and woman, Jesus said, uh, God is spirit. So uh, the Father is a spirit. The Son is obviously a spirit as well. He's always a spirit in, in, in a man. Yes? Yes. Uh, so you have three spirits, at least. You have three persons, not spirit. And they're each, they're they are spiritual, that is, they are not limited to some kind of physicality. So they are spiritual, and they are not limited to creation. That does not make them three spirits, as in, for example, uh, sometimes you've gone to book Revelation, and the apocalyptic language is used there, the seven spirits of God, which just simply means that God has all, that the spirit has all knowledge. Uh, that, that kind of, of trying to come up with extra numbers or something like that, I don't think anyone reading the New Testament originally would have been able to follow where you're coming from there. Speaking of numbers and seven spirits, uh, how do you know that there are only three persons in, in, in the That's what I was referring to before, uh, because as you said earlier, I believe in Sola Scriptura. And if you'd like to suggest a fourth divine person, when we have Matthew chapter 28, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, show me where the fourth is. Uh, the, the, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ with you all, where's the fourth? There is no force. How do you know there's not a fourth manifesting himself or herself on another planet or another galaxy somewhere? <laughs> well, that's that's a Battlestar Galactica is about. You know, <laughs> really, I, don't, you know, uh, I love Star Wars but, uh, and Star Trek, but I'm not, not going to get into that. We don't. We how do we not know that? Because Sola Scriptura tells us that Scripture has given to His Church everything the Church needs to know now to worship Him in truth. But so then, if I'm going to worship Him in truth, I need to know who He. Yeah, but, but you, I think we should humbly say that uh, looking at the scripture, all we know is so far three persons have revealed themselves to us the Father in the Old Testament, the Son and the Holy Spirit in the New. And, and we don't know if there's a 
fourth or fifth or seventh person up there, except that the purpose of the revelation of Jesus Christ is to accomplish with finality the revelation of God's entire intentions and the wrapping up of all things in Christ. So the very idea that there would be another one goes against what Scripture says. Thank you, James. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Uh, Dr. White, you may now go your five minute closing remarks at the podium. Five minutes is not a lot of time. Let me start off. I started a tradition in 2006. Uh, Shabir and I debated for the first time at my old university, and I started a tradition there that has now gone all over the world of uh, giving uh, my Muslim interlocutors a gift. I have the new updated edition of the Forgotten Trinity. Uh, so you know you have this. Uh, Shabir gets it. And, and I have here the Tyndale House produced at Cambridge Leather Greek New Testament that has that came out only last year. It's a very interesting edition. We'll have to talk about it sometime. That's what we're going to Now, you have decisions to make. I honestly believe that if you will go back, I'm so glad this is being recorded. Go back and listen carefully. You will find a number of instances where standards were being used by Deer Shabir in his analysis of the New Testament that he would never apply to the Quran and that he didn't when I asked questions about the authorship, content of the Quran, and the knowledge of the individuals. And you'll hear his normal presentation, and that is, well, you've got this progression. Mark doesn't know anything about the deity of Christ. John has, he even said that I said this in the book. What I said in the book is that John clearly addresses issues that the Synoptic Gospels do not address, but that I did not say and did not intimate and do not believe that you do not have clear and compelling testimony of the deity of Christ in the Gospel of Mark. You do. If you can read Mark chapter 14 and Jesus standing before his accusers conflates Psalm 110 and Daniel chapter 7, puts them together in a way that the Jews know exactly what it is he is saying. So much so that the high priest tears his robes and says, you've heard the blasphemy. Why do we need any further testimony? Why do we need any further witnesses? He is worthy of death. If you can see what Jesus does in Mark and not recognize, even as Bart Ehrman recognizes that even there you have a divine person, though he does not take it to the doctrine of the Trinity, then you are missing something. I would invite you, please, in light of the beginning of the, the, the first 10 minutes of my questions, please go to YouTube tonight, look up James White, Shabir Ali, look at our debate in, I think it was Pretoria. Did we read this? Pretoria? I think we did. In Pretoria, South Africa, did the earliest followers of Jesus believe he was God? That has the graphics from 1 Corinthians chapter 8. The evidence there is absolutely overwhelming. Please take a, take a look at it. So, we were told by Shabir that we should listen to the Quran, a book that came 600 years later, Despite the fact that we were not given any evidence whatsoever that the Quran understood the content of the New Testament, even what was in the New Testament. And what evidence were we given? Because Shabir can interpret certain passages in a Unitarian fashion, rather than allowing the entire New Testament to speak. At one point, for example, he said, comparing Paul and Muhammad, well, we should look at Paul and compare him to Jesus' words. Paul, as a vision of Jesus, is accepted by Jesus' followers, writes in the first century, and his writings are accepted by the Christians. And that is compared with someone who comes 600 years later, who knows nothing about the content of the New Testament, contradicts the fundamental teaching of the New Testament. In Surah 112, it says, He neither begets nor has he begotten, a clear contradiction of what the Christians were saying, and were to believe that one on the basis of some comparison with Paul and Muhammad? No, I'm sorry. 
Take the time. I'm sure the videos will be up in a relatively short period of time, though we in the digital age demand they be up tonight. Uh, take the time when they are made available. Listen carefully. Go back over the scriptures and ask yourself who is presenting a consistent and coherent case. I think when you do, you will see that what we have here is the revelation of God in the incarnation, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, 600 years later in another place, was rejected going back to the old ways. The question is, will we believe what the followers of Jesus said in the first century, or someone who was not a follower of Jesus said in centuries later? Thank you very much for your attention. And as we come to the end, folks, before your questions, uh, let me um, also present a, a gift to my good friend uh, on the, the, the new evangelical uh, subordination, subordinationism, person. Yeah. <laughs> So you see tonight that in looking at the doctrine of the Trinity, there are many problems that are left unanswered. And um, uh, my friend James could uh, mostly just simply say, well, you know, we, have, we, we don't have to think about that, we just go about what the scriptures say, and so on. But we do have to think about it, because when Muslims say there is only one God, period, that's the end of it, the Muslim knows what they, they have said, and that's the end. Now, if you say that God is one in three persons, then how do you know that there is only three persons? Now, if you stress the doctrine of sola scriptura, scripture alone, but well, that makes sense. Yeah, let the scripture tell us, because that's God telling us who he is. But if there is no statement in the Bible that says that there are only three persons, the most a Christian can say is that so far, our Bibles and our experiences have only shown us that there are three persons in the divine Godhead. However, we have to be open to the possibility that ontologically there could be other divine persons that we don't know about. We've only show, been shown three so far. Imagine the people in the Old Testament. According to uh, what, what James uh, did when he held up a light box, he showed that in the Old Testament people saw God as one person. But now in the New Testament period they're seeing God as three persons when the light is separated into three, the red, green, and blue. Well now, if the Old Testament folks were only seeing God as one person, and then in the New Testament now you're seeing God as two more persons because they happen to reveal themselves, you cannot be sure that ontologically there are only three persons in the Godhead absolutely. You have to be open to the possibility that there are more, but you just don't know about that. So when you speak about the Trinity, you cannot say that this is all of God, you can only say this is all of God that we know so far. Whereas when the Muslim says, God is only one, that is a simple, declarative, and complete statement. And it corresponds with what uh, Paul himself said. There is no God but one in the very passage that uh, James built so much upon. James says, you believe that God is one, great, even the, the devil knows that and shudders. And James doesn't go on to say, well, we have to know something else, but there are three persons. No, now he goes on to talk about good works. So the belief completely is that there is only one God, there, there is nothing more to say. That's why the Quran says, Wala ta'kulu talasa, do not say three, in shahul khairan lakum, and this is, it will be better for you. So the Quran says, stop saying three, just say that in the Allah we love wahid, there is, God is only one God, and that, that is the statement of uh, the Muslim and Christian uh, faith. And so, in, <laughs> Paul said, and James says, well, Mark also has testimony that uh, Jesus uh, is uh, divine. But look at Daniel 7. Daniel 7 does not show that this son of man figure is God. It, yes, this is a divine figure, but it's this somewhere up, up here in heaven, and he comes down to earth. First of all, is he Jesus? Bruce Chilton says no. In Mark's Gospel, when Jesus speaks about the Son of Man, notice he uses the third person. You will see the Son of Man, not that you will see me. He's talking about somebody else, possibly. Uh, and uh, secondly, this other person is not God, but God is the Ancient of Days, and this the Son of Man 
if you even call him the son of man, because Rumi says one who is, looks like a man. This one who looks like a man goes up to the divine throne and takes the scroll. Uh, and this actually, in Daniel 7 itself, is shown to be the saints. It, it is the people of Israel altogether who will be given universal rule according to that passage. It's not about some futuristic divine uh, figure to come uh, it, it, to, to our world. And so there are so many problems. Psalm 110, this is quoted so many times in the New Testament that it deserves some mention. There too, there is a distinction between Yahweh and Adoni. Yahweh said to Adoni, Adoni is my Lord, true, but that's a different, that's Adon. And that's the a simple meaning sir today. Like uh, modern Hebrew, if you say Adoni, you mean sir. Adoni, excuse me sir. Uh, that, that's how people use this term to, even today. But knowing the language from that time, Yahweh said to Adini, that means there's a distinction. There is one God who is called Yahweh, there's somebody else called Adini, my Lord, and it's that Lord that is being spoken about. That shows that there is no trinity. God is only one, one person, and you do not need to have this trinity. Finally, let us leave this all tonight as friends working together for the greater good, Muslims and Christians, together, hand in hand, in mutual love and cooperation. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Let's thank our debaters one more time. So at this point, we'll be transitioning into a Q&A session. So we're going to have two lines running down the middle of this auditorium. So try and scooch those chairs as much as you can. The line on this side will be questions for Dr. White, and the line on this side will be questions for Dr. Ali. Uh, should, uh, Hassan and I uh, will be standing up here with the microphone. We'll be holding it. Uh, you get about 30 seconds to ask your question. Uh, whoever the question is addressed to will have two minutes to reply, and then whoever wasn't being addressed to will have one minute to respond. So with that out of the way, let's begin. Doctor, uh, um, uh, thank you for coming here, by the way, Dr. Ali. Uh, my question is, so in John chapter 1, verse 3, it says that Jesus created all things, and that without him was not anything made that was made. This seems to say, imply that everything that was created was created by Jesus. So doesn't that mean that Jesus is uncreated, according to John? Uh, no, it wouldn't mean that. Uh, let me refer. So what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 28, when he says that uh, when I say all things, I don't mean God because he's obviously excluded from the all things which will be uh, subjected to him. But what was it necessary for him to even say that? If he didn't say that, some people might be asking the same question that you asked. But, but we should take the, the statements reasonably. Uh, what John is referring to here is what colors are traced back to the writings of Philo of Alexandria, where he spoke about the Logos as the Word of God, through which God created everything. Uh, the uh, Old Testament used the term uh, Sophia, which almost means the same thing, uh, but that is feminine, Sophia. And Sophia speaks of the woman uh, who is a personified wisdom of God in the Old Testament and says that she was there when God laid the foundations of the world. Uh, but uh, in uh, Proverbs chapter 8, verse number 22, Sophia speaks and says, Yahweh created me. So Sophia is created. And so it, what we have here is a concept in which God created a, a being and then used that being as a, the conduit through which to create everything else. That's why Paul could say we have one Lord Jesus Christ through everything uh, through whom everything was made. That's why John 1, 1 uh, and following could say that through the law of us, Everything that has been made that has been made. It doesn't mean to exclude the logos, 
Uh, but then again, there is an ambiguity there, and, and I will give you that. But throughout, it is very clear that Jesus says in John's Gospel, I live because of the thought. That means he's dependent upon the thought. So if we think of the contingency argument for the existence of, of God, God is the necessary being, and there everything else is contingent upon God. It's clear that there is a statement that Jesus is contingent upon God, and therefore he himself is not God. John chapter 1, verse 3 does teach exactly what was said. Uh, no exegesis was offered to that. Instead, there are other places and other interpretations to try to report upon that. Simply look at the Gospel of John. Recognize it starts with this statement. It ends with Thomas saying, my Lord and my God. Uh, John 17, 5, Jesus refers to the fact that he eternally existed in the presence of the Father, was glorious in the presence of the Father. That's only one sentence after John 17, 3, which had been quoted earlier, but out of that context. And so, even people like Bart Ehrman recognize this is clearly what the Gospel of John's all about. My point is, when you go back to the, back to the Gospel of Mark, and you actually listen to the fact that the one who approaches the ancient days in uh, Daniel chapter 7 is worshipped, is, 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 his people worship him. This is why the, the high priest tears his robes. He didn't have Shabir's interpretation of that text. Just what same thing in John chapter 1. Hebrews 5, 7, 9 says, In the day of his flesh, Jesus offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. He was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became a source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. If Jesus was a human son of God and not God himself, I can understand why he would need to show reverence in order to be heard, why he would need to learn obedience, and why he would need to be made perfect. Can you help me understand how to make sense of these facts of Scripture from Trinitarian perspective? Yes, especially since the book of Hebrews lays this out with such clarity that when the writer begins with these tremendous statements in Hebrews chapter 1 about Jesus, uh, the one through whom everything is made, and he's the exact representation of the Father, and you've got uh, uh, being called God, and Psalm 102 being applied to him. When the writer starts there as his supremacy over every created thing, then you have the discussion that continues from that being Jesus' role as our intermediate. And we are told in Hebrews, starting in Hebrews 2, that because the children partake of flesh and blood, he had to partake of flesh and blood. And so very often what you hear Shabir doing and other Unitarians doing is they focus upon the incarnate Christ and the fact that he submits himself to the Father to accomplish the redemption of God's people and then extrapolate backwards from that to deny the deity of Christ. This is what happens when you do not take the entire New Testament and allow it to speak and to define its own terms. I accept everything the New Testament teaches. I do not then get rid of those portions that do not fit into my narrow Unitarian assumptions, which is what takes place so often. And so, in eternity past, as Jesus says in John 17, 5, glorious in the presence of the Father, Creator of all things, nothing made apart from him. In him all things soon as they can. They hold together. And yet he humbles himself. Why? So that he can be the perfect, obedient son who by his death provides perfect salvation for those who are united to him by the decree of the Father, and then they experience that, that union by faith and repentance in time so that we can have eternal life in Jesus Christ. It's a valid question because it shows that uh, uh, Jesus was uh, dependent on the Father. Now, what it, uh, James could say, well, that's because he uh, underwent kenosis. He gave up some of his divine prerogatives. But what prerogatives did he give up? What was he before he became incarnate as a human being? And James is referring to the beginning of Hebrews. Uh, but here at the beginning of Hebrews, chapter 1, uh, verse number uh, 9, uh, God speaks to this person and says, You love justice and gave wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. This shows that whatever Jesus was before he became a man, he had companions. Uh, and we know that God is a fully generous. He doesn't have anyone equal to him. And, and he has a God. God, your God, has uh, anointed you. So this God has anointed him that has made him Christ. 
And that's where John's gospel it is clear that John has a two-tier uh, system where there is God and below him, uh, Jesus. <coughs> uh, Dr. Ali, in your opening, you seem to indicate that the reason why the uh, Quran doesn't accurately condemn the Trinity, or for example, why the Quran doesn't address modalism, is because the Quran was interacting with the Christians of their immediate environment. Uh, hence, you asserted that the Quran displaces the Bible as the sole reference. Would you please elaborate on this? Yes, uh, Angelica Neuwert uh, has actually recently uh, written a book in which she has dealt with this at great length, a German scholar. And uh, in this book, she shows that uh, the Quran had its own way uh, of, of making waves at the time. Rather than engaging in detail, uh, with the beliefs of, uh, of, of a lot of people, the Quran stated certain uh, principles in general and made such uh, a, a deep impact on people that people rallied to the Quran as the book of God. This was going to be their sole reference point, and uh, from there on, Muslims had the clarity on what the Quran is calling them to believe. Neil Robinson, in his book, in his book Christ in Islam and Christianity, made a similar point uh, here and there, uh, where he showed that if the Quran were to engage with all of these, uh, various uh, doctrines, imagine the, what the Quran would have to do and what kind of book the Quran would have to become to deal with the problem of tritheism, to deal with the problem of modalism, to deal with patriot passionism. All of the, the creeds of Christian history, starting with the Apostles' Creed, how is the Quran going to all of the history and tell you this is what the Apostles' Creed was, this is what the first Nicene Creed was, this is what the second Nicene Creed was? Because the first Nicene Creed, they didn't say that the Holy Spirit is to be worshipped. The second Nicene Creed, they included worship of the Holy Spirit. Then they didn't decide on the deity of the Holy Spirit until the Council of Constantinople in 1981. And then finally, Council of, uh, the Council of Chalcedon in 450, in which the final details of the Trinity were, hand, were hammered out. And then we have the confusing Athanasian Creed, which is cited in, in, the, uh, in the James's book approvingly. Where they, you know, it reads something like, uh, you know, God is creator, the Son is creator, the Holy Spirit is creator, but yet there is only one creator. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, yet there is only one God. And it goes on and on like this. And then it says, this is how you must think about the Trinity, otherwise uh, you will lose your salvation. So, for the Quran to say all this, the simple thing was to just do what the Bible said. Norbert said, the Quran uh, displaced the previous uh, writings. Well, the problem with that, of course, is the Quran doesn't displace it, and it can't, because anyone who's read the Quran recognizes that it assumes that its readers already have the biblical narrative as the background. You can't make heads or tails out of most of what the Quran says if you do not already understand the framework of the biblical narrative, references to Watts and to Moses. It is taken for granted by the author of the Quran that you've already read the Quran in Jim. It can't displace it. It alleges in its own words that it is the continuation of that revelation. When we test it, as it invites us to test it, it fails, and it fails badly, especially on the fact that it tells us, if you say three, hellfire is yours, and when it defines the three in Surah 5, 116, it gets the three wrong. So this becomes the issue that simply cannot be left to the side and said, well, they're just talking about something. Thank you both. So many questions. A little time, Dr. White. You both referenced uh, Psalm 101, which is the classic Old Testament text. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, so I can make your enemies your footstool. As you well know, the Hebrew there, Adoni, is translated as the Greek, using the modern Greek uh, pronunciation, Dokirio Mu, and which means to my Lord. So the question is, how do you account, Dr. White, for the fact that that phrase, Tokiriomu, is never used for deity, for God? Um, the same way I've responded to Dr. Buzzard's presentation of this for many years, including uh, in our debate, I would recommend that you look at the debate that Michael Brown and I did with Dr. Buzzard and Joseph Good on the Jewish Voice broadcast, and on our unbelievable exchange we had as well. This is a very clear it's amazing, it amazes me that this is still being presented by anyone because it's been refuted without question. The vowel pointing in Hebrew came after 
the time of Jesus. It is not inspired. Therefore, to focus upon vowel pointing is to focus upon that which is not inspired to make your case. The Jews didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah, and they certainly didn't believe in the deity of Christ, and they certainly understood that Psalm 1101 is the most quoted text from the Old Testament in the New. So it is not surprising whatsoever. So when the person asked that was never used to deity, they're basing that upon the Masoretic vowel pointing from the Jews rather than the consonantal form. And that leaves us wondering, we wonder what the high priest was actually doing tearing his robes. Because if you if you take Shabir's interpretation of Daniel 7, together with that interpretation of Psalm 1101, the high priest in Mark 14 should have gone, oh, okay, no problem. But instead, he tears his robes and says, you heard the blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Someone is missing the plain meaning of the text here, and that's where it's coming from. So when it's said it's never used for God, that's based upon the Hebrew Masoretic vowel pointing, and that is the fundamental problem with this assumption. It comes after the time of the New Testament. It's not inspired. It is not the ground of Christian faith. It's hard to believe that this Jewish uh, leader um, thought that he had before him God, and he's thinking, this is God, let's kill it. Um, it's more likely that if Jesus claimed to be God, that this leader is thinking, well, this is a man, he's claiming to be God, so let's kill him, and we're fulfilling the Old Testament law. Now, in that case, uh, he seems to be celebrating, however, however, uh, while this is more likely, I'm not saying this situation, uh, but, but while this, while this is more likely, is that uh, it, 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 now it makes sense if we think about the psychology of this Jewish leader. Uh, but then it creates a problem for God, because it would show God to be irresponsible. He knows himself to be God, he doesn't prove himself to be God, he claims to be God, knowing that he already gave this guy a law, saying that if somebody like me comes and claims, to be God, you have to kill him. So that means that God has a death wish, he comes in and he makes the Jews responsible for his own death. That would be wrong. So uh, you asked, or the Quran tells us to uh, judge the people of the gospel to judge according to what God has revealed in the gospel. And an example that you gave of that is Christians over at uh, Jesus' work of Tony. Uh, you gave that as an example of that big dumb if I understood you correctly. But what we have of Jesus' words is what the authors of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts say Jesus' words were. So how does the Quran want me to do that um, without also at the same time making those narrative accounts authoritative for the life and work of Jesus Christ and the words of Jesus Christ? And then will we not also stack those up against the Quran, just like you want us to do with the words of the Paul. So, uh, when the Quran was revealed some, seven, uh, some 1400 years ago in the 7th century, uh, obviously the Quran had to accept many things that uh, could not be changed uh, overnight. And, and one of these things is the fact that at the time of Nicaea, Macedonian free, uh, Christians are already set in their ways. The Quran is not going to change that overnight. Uh, so, and, and the, the apparatus for studying the details of the life of history uh, of, of Jesus historically uh, was, was not yet fully available. So the Quran is putting things in such a way that, that may have a, a, a greater applicability and meaning later on, when people could actually do this. But the Quran is actually saying something that even people at the time could have thought about. Because when Christians were discussing the Trinity and what should be believed about Jesus, they were citing scripture, and they were asking who wrote scripture. But that history was somewhat forgotten, and people now uh, are, are not thinking clearly. Remember the change that said uh, when it referred to Hebrews, if Paul did not write Hebrews, then. What do you mean if Paul did not write Hebrews? That means the question mark. Who wrote Hebrews? And nowadays it is widely recognized that Hebrews is anonymous. We don't know who wrote it, and from, most likely Paul didn't write it. Uh, so, uh, if questions like this have to be asked. Okay, if you depend on Hebrews to know that uh, he was this glorified figure, 
who is the author of Hebrews? Why should we depend on him? If we depend on Paul to say that uh, Jesus was the wisdom and power of God, how do we know we should trust Paul? If we depend on John, who is this John who wrote the fourth gospel? Do we even know that his name is John? And so on. So uh, Christians can still ask these questions. And yes, I, I, uh, Paul, uh, James was saying in the book of Trinity that there is a development. Why, why didn't Mark say, uh, Jesus said, Ego Amy? Because, uh, you know, maybe he said it, but Mark didn't really pick it up. He didn't quite understand the, the implication of that. Only John thought about it much later on. I wasn't misquoting James, right here in his book. And I'll quote you the page number in case you're interested. So, in, in short, that's what the Quran is asking you to do. Think, reflect, understand. Okay, first of all, uh, Jesus quoted from a text in the Old Testament where we don't know the author. Jesus was a prophet according to the Muslim perspectives. That's the Muslim. You can't, you can't make that kind of objection. It is, uh, it is relevant. Uh, but the Quran gives us no reason to think. He, he mentioned the Council of Nicaea. It's not, not going to change the Council of Nicaea, right? The Quran gives us no reason to think the author of the Quran had any clue what the Council of Nicaea said, what the content of the Council of Nicaea's decrees were, or anything else. That's the point. We are being asked, you need to submit to this book that's half the length of the New Testament, whose author had no earthly idea what the extent of the New Testament was or the contents of the New Testament was, but that needs to become the lens through which you read everything in your New Testament. And Christians have said down through the centuries, I'm sorry, that is not a compelling argument. We're not going to do that. We're going to stick with the eyewitnesses, not with someone who comes 600 years later. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I've seen both of your YouTube videos so I really commend you for being a very respectful, honest, sincere interlocutor of the Muslim community. My question is, uh, you just mentioned a good standard, uh, and using your standards of judgment for the Quran, uh, can we judge the New Testament similarly? So specifically, if God knows what was always unchanging, uh, using only the Old Testament without reference to the New Testament, can you prove the Trinity, specifically that the Son and the Spirit are included in Yahweh, and if not, why not? If not, why not? The, uh, the, the why not is because the Trinity is revealed in the astounding reality of the Incarnation and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There are passages that prophesy of these things that can only be understood in light of that reality, which would include Isaiah 9-6, Isaiah 7 14, things like that. Um, but I do not make the assertion that the Trinity is revealed in the Old Testament, so I would not, I would not even utilize that standard. My assertion in the book that was just held up, both editions of it, um, is very, very clearly that the New Testament writers were themselves experiential Trinitarians because every word of the New Testament is written after the incarnation of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, the empty tomb, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's what makes sense of all the statements of the, of the early Christians. That's why Paul can talk about they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. He doesn't have to stop and say, well, let me tell you what the Lord of glory is because you never heard of this. No, they already know. They already know that Jesus is the glorious Lord. James was brought up earlier. James also refers to him in the same phraseology. His brother refers to him by exalted phraseology in that exact same way. So all the New Testament writers are functioning on the, the, the communal recognition of what has taken place in the coming of Jesus Christ the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And now they can then see the shadows and the fulfillment and the prophecy, most definitely. But they are now living in the reality of it. And the simple fact of the matter is, if you reject this, you will have to end up rejecting portions of what every single New Testament writer says. You just have to kick them out, because they make straightforward statements that Shabir has already identified as absolute sure. From your perspective, you can't let the New Testament speak for itself in that manner. Uh, James says that the New Testament writers were experiential Trinitarians. How do you know that? Like, how do you know what's in their mind? How do you know they weren't globalists? Uh, how do you know they were not Unitarians? How do you know that they did not think that Jesus is a, a, a divine being, but not God, who came down and became flesh? In fact, we can see that many of them actually thought so. Uh, that, that, that's what exactly they described. Uh, Paul described that, John described that, uh, the uh, writer of Hebrews described that, 
uh, the book of Revelation, which has one of the highest Christologies. Read Revelation chapter 3 and see how many times in one verse uh, the God of Jesus is being spoken about. And, and so that is Jesus and his God, Jesus and his God, Jesus and his God. Why isn't Jesus called God? Uh, read uh, uh, Revelation chapter 15, verse number 3. The psalm of, uh, of Jesus and Moses. How they're praising God. So they are worshiping God. So this is, yes, some passages might refer to Jesus as a glorified figure, but he has a God. And, and, and that shows that God hasn't changed. Malachi chapter 3, verse number 6 says God does not change. And he didn't change. He didn't become a trinity. He was always a, 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 a singular God, one person. appreciate the dialogue tonight. Um, Dr. Ali, uh, I have a question um, that's kind of two parts. Um, first, how do Muslims consider the, the texts of the New Testament and the Torah, respectively? And with those perspectives in mind, um, how and where would a person learn about uh, Jesus? So, uh, the, the Quran shows that uh, there are some uh, revelations in the uh, Christian Bible, including the Torah and the Psalms and, and the Gospel, uh, which are from God. And at the same time, uh, there are uh, some other writings by other people which uh, may or may not be uh, valid. So, one has to use uh, discernment and, and, and ask uh, questions about the scripture. So, for example, the Quran in the second chapter. And the 79 verse says, Woe to those who write the scripture with their own hands. And then they say, this is from God. So the Quran is asking uh, Christians uh, and our Jewish friends uh, to be discerning about who wrote what. Do we know these persons? Were they really inspired? Uh, think about uh, James saying that the New Testament writers uh, were filled with the Holy Spirit. How do we know that? Because they said that, right? So, so this you have this circular reasoning where they, you should believe that they had the Spirit because they had the, they said that they had the Holy Spirit. But there's no independent verification. And uh, Christians may feel, but we have some independent verification because the Spirit is in me. But, but how do you know that's the Spirit in you? How do you know that's not your own mind? But what does the Spirit actually say to you? Do you hear a voice in your mind saying to you, uh, Paul, go up the straight street? Do you, do you get such a, a voice in your mind? Or is that your own subconscious mind because you've been brought up in a culture in which it is believed that there is a Holy Spirit inhabiting you, that you feel that there is a Holy Spirit inhabiting you? Now remember John chapter 16 saying that the Holy Spirit will come, this character, and he will uh, teach you things. I have much to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. What did the Holy Spirit actually teach the first Christians? Did anybody write down something and say, well, this is what the Holy Spirit uh, said to me, like any one of the books? Why does Luke start by, by showing that he did his research and his writing? Why does the Holy Spirit inspired me to write this whole book? Only Revelation claims something like that, and yet that was one of the last books to be accepted after much debate in the New Testament. Except that book of Revelation also, where it says Jesus talks, it talks about Jesus and his God, which the Trinity explains as an incarnate man. He's not an atheist, he's going to have a God. Also describes Jesus as the Almighty God. We believe everything the book of Revelation says, not just parts of it. You're seeing this over and over again this evening. One of us accepts everything and allows it to speak for itself. One says, well, it can't be that because it says something over here. You end up with just parts of it. And as to Spirit of God, well, why should I believe that Muhammad had the Spirit of God? If he had the Spirit of God, he would have known what the Spirit of God had already given in the Torah and the Injil. But he didn't, and he didn't accurately represent it. And in fact, when he tried to represent it in Surah 5, 116, he got it completely wrong. So why should I believe that Muhammad had the Spirit? You know why I believe in the Holy Spirit? I'm sitting on the other side of the planet, and there's a bunch of people in this room who believe exactly what I believe about an empty tomb and a risen Savior, and if that doesn't say the Holy Spirit's in the world, I don't know what does. Yes, Hi, thank you both of you for being here tonight. So Dr. White, um, you mentioned the criteria of being consistent. So you quote the Philippians 2 chapter in 17, uh, referring to the Phenosis, and uh, in your debates in your book, you mentioned that the sun is pre-existent, and in history, it joined with the human nature, and then the Messiah, Jesus Christ, came into existence at the time of incarnation. So it's not that Jesus pre-existed, but in fact, the sun was pre-existent, 
and the Messiah Jesus at the time of incarnation, that person is called the Messiah, the, you know, Jesus Christ. But even in, the, in your debate right now, you actually refer to again and again Jesus pre-existing. In Philippians 2, actually, Paul specifies the Messiah Christ and applies the kenosis to this Messiah, not some pre-existing one. It doesn't say there's a pre-existing one. And similarly in John 17, 5, in 17, 3, Jesus has already identified himself as the Messiah. But you are saying that the Son pre-existed and the Messiah came into existence at a certain point in time. So how do you like, uh, you know, understand this? Is, is the definition of Paul in terms of incarnation different? Because he clearly identifies the Messiah and he's applying the Carmen Christi to the Messiah, not the pre-existing Son. Well, uh, Paul actually does. For example, Colossians, when he talks about the one through whom all things were made, he specifically references the Son at that point. So that's an artificial distinction. What we're saying is that there is a divine person who is the Son, who is the one who is chosen by the triune God as the one who is going to come into and take on a human nature in the incarnation. John 1 14, that Logos became flesh. So there are to, we, we should differentiate between, for example, the functions of Jesus as Messiah here on earth. And so we do that, and we, we are careful, but there are other times when, for example, when Paul says, crucify the Lord of glory, that's taking two different categories and putting them together because Jesus was one person. So there are times when, you, when, you're, when you're just simply talking about Jesus as a person, you can talk about uh, the, the, the pre-incarnate state of Jesus, but we may very carefully, we are not saying that the Son has eternally existed uh, in, in fleshment, the enfleshment, the incarnation took place at a point in time. Jesus wasn't a man prior to the incarnation. Um, so it just it just depends on what level of strictness you're utilizing at any particular point in time as to what you're making reference. Paul does not have a different perspective than John, uh, or Paul does not contradict himself. Um, we can we can talk about Jesus having eternally existed, but what we're talking about is the Son has eternally existed, and it's the Son who took on human flesh, and it's the Son who will return someday as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, judge the living and dead, because he left behind an empty tomb. So, um, yeah, we, we, we do recognize that the New Testament gives those distinctions, but sometimes we don't speak really, really specifically as to which time period. So, um, at that point is addressed in this book, God of Jesus, by Keegan Chandler. I was referring to this book, but I won't go into the technicalities of this point. So I want to use my minute to address a couple of other points. Um, the James that keeps the harping on at Quran chapter 5, verse 116. And, but I think he's misunderstood the verse. The verse is not saying that the Trinity comprises Father, Son, and uh, the Mother. Uh, it's saying it, 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 it creates a, it shows us a dramatic scene that God's going to ask Jesus, "Did you tell people to take me and my mother as God beside God?" Now that obviously is a drama directed against people who did take the mother of Jesus uh, as uh, as another God, and and some people have. And now I hold here a book by uh, F. F. Bruce, Jesus and Christian Origins Outside the New Testament, and on page one seventy seven, he's sympathetic towards uh, this Quranic passage. And he says that this uh, could have referred to Syriac Christianity, in which the spirit is actually considered to be feminine. And on page 101 of this book, he goes into more detail, showing that Jesus, according to the Gospel of the Hebrews, uh, cries out, my mother, the Holy Spirit. Good morning. Um, Dr. Ali, thank you for being here tonight. And, um, before I ask me. <laughs> before I ask my question, can I... Clarify, ask a couple questions for clarification. So you deny the deity of Jesus, and you also mentioned that um, Jesus did never claim that he's God. Okay, so um, so in Exodus three fourteen, God told Moses, "I am who I am." This is what you are to say to the Israelites. So God sent Moses say to tell Israel, "I am who I am." So back in John chapter eight uh, verses, they said from Jesus talking to with the Pharisees to Israel, said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and you and, and have you seen Abraham? 
And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Therefore, the Jew, they pick up stones to throw at them, but Jesus did himself on the of the temple. How would you respond to that? First of all, about people picking up stones to stone Jesus, uh, this ties in with something that came up before. And remember, Jesus said, in part of the Gospel of John itself, says to the people, you are determined to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. That's in John chapter 8, verse number 40. They are determined to kill him, by hook or crook. Just because Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath, according to John, took to Mark's Gospel, they already started plotting to kill him. So they, they wanted some excuse to kill him. It's not because they understood that he is claiming to be God, it's that they're trying to put it into his mouth. So Matthew and Luke, recording the statement uh, in, in the last trial, uh, have the Jesus say, say to the interlocutor, you say that I am. So it's, it's ambiguous. But even if he actually said I, I am, he, he was not saying I am God. If he's saying ego emi, which means I am, it's a very common statement in the Greek uh, language. And the I am of Exodus chapter 3, verse 14 is ambiguous. Uh, it's almost like God saying, that, never mind what I am. And so if Jesus is also saying, like, never mind what I am, uh, then uh, it's ambiguous. And, and this uh, uh, characterizes much of Trinitarian thinking. There's a lot of vagueness. There's a lot of equivocation. Things mean something like that, and that means something like that, so this must mean something like that, and so on. There's a lot of false connections this way. But we have simple, clear, declarative statements uh, showing that Jesus uh, denied that he is God, like for example in Mark chapter uh, 12, verse number uh, 28, when he declared the Shema, and the man said to him, you are right, teacher, there is only one God, and beside him there is no other. Obviously they're talking about somebody else who is God, and Jesus is right there in front of him. And Jesus praised the man for his wisdom. On another occasion, a man came and knelt before Jesus and said, good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. And that particular passage, Jesus was not saying, I'm a sinner. He was saying, man, you don't know who you're dealing with. But you want to know how ambiguous this is about the I am sayings? In John chapter 18, the soldiers come to arrest Jesus. And when he says, I am, what happens to the soldiers? They fall down upon the ground. Folks, that's not ambiguous. That's as clear as can be. John in John 8, 24 says, and Jesus says, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. John 8, 58, when he says, I am, they pick up stones to stone him. And in John 13, 19, he tells his disciples, I'm telling you before it happens, so when it happens, you may believe that I am, quoting from Isaiah 43, 10, where Jehovah identifies himself as the I am. I am is not ambiguous. It is another phrase used for Yahweh from Jesus' own lips. You'll only call that ambiguous if you have another reason not to believe what the New Testament says. So, Dr. John, thank you very much for, for Dr. Ali. Thank you for uh, this conversation. Uh, Dr. I have uh, just one quick question, actually, is that uh, Trinity started, and we all know that, with Jesus. So can you explain how the Trinity we can define before Jesus? Where was the connection between Son, Father, and Spirit before Jesus was born? And unfortunately, I have another question about that. In your rebuttal arguments, you have said that, uh, and you uh, repeated many times that how Islam can, or uh, Quran can cancel or some uh, nullify some argument about Christianity after 600 years. Can we apply this? Can we apply the same standard for the Christianity when it uh, cancels the Moses uh, Sharia or Moses principles or other Abrahamic religions? So, how you can do that? Well, there are two questions there. I answered the first one previously. Another another individual asked that exact same question, and I, I already answered that one. So, I'll ask the second one. Uh, and the answer is no, uh, because the New Testament writers know the Old Testament very, very well. They quote from it constantly, and they're not saying that Moses is Shavia, it's that way, but it is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and they make the strong argument, for example, the book of Hebrews, that that's the reality. There is no meaningful documentary connection between the Quran and either the Old or New Testament. It doesn't quote it, 
The author doesn't know what's in it. He quotes stuff as if it's in it that isn't in it. Um, there is a huge chasm. And the question I've been asking all evening uh, is, why is this? So, for example, sir, 5116. You all go read it for yourself. If the Quran says, do not say three, you show me anywhere in the Quran where you have three names other than Surah 5116. And you say, well, he's just, he's just dealing with a particular group right there. Read elsewhere where it's in, in Surah 5, where it's specifically making the argument that if you say three, and then it says, see how Allah makes his signs clear? Because Mary ate food. Well, who's he dealing with there? We believe Mary ate food. We believe Jesus ate food. But the idea is clearly the author is trying to make an argument against the idea of the exaltation of Mary, the status of Godhood, and the only time the three is ever mentioned is there in Surah 5116. You never have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It was well known, but it's never addressed. And yet, we've been told that the Trinitarian worship is sure. That's why I say, I'm sorry, the vast chasm in that 600 years means there's no connection. There is a connection between the Old and New Testament. Is very, very clearly laid out. There isn't anything between the Bible and the Quran. Mm -hmm. I, I have to bring up something that uh, it doesn't give me any pleasure to bring up, but, but uh, I in the light that I have. Uh, now, when we look at what the Quran says, it's very clear that the Quran understands uh, its Christian beliefs and practices and, and denounces. Uh, misrepresentations of Jesus and misrepresentations of God in a very general way. It shows that there is only one God, which is the original teaching of the Old Testament, teaching of Jesus. It shows that Jesus is a prophet and messenger of God. And so it reverses the distortion of Jesus that occurred in the New Testament writings and in the subsequent Christian creeds. Now speaking about the distortion, James is proud to say that the New Testament writers knew the Old Testament and they quoted the, New, the Old Testament. But he doesn't tell us is that the New Testament writers actually misquote the Old Testament a lot. And this whole book deals with the New Testament views of the Old Testament by, by several authors. And there is one by C.K. Peel in which there is uh, an article that is entitled Matthew Twists the Scriptures. I'd like you to look at that. This is the last question of the night. Oh. Oh. I guess with that, and because it's the last, maybe do something a little bit different. Hopefully, both of you guys can answer this. Again, thank you both so much for coming and um, just how this has gone. I think with that, it's more than just this debate and going back and forth with you as individual debaters, but as individual people, wondering beyond this debate or what we're doing here, um, if there's one thing about this in your position outside of this debate, outside of anything you can say, outside of anything you can say, that anything you want to do. Is there one thing that we talk about our mutual seeking of truth that for you could change your perspective on this? What, what would it take for your position on this to change down the road outside of this debate? Is that so what would it take for me to change my position? I, I would say that uh, I continue to read and study in preparation for this debate. I've read uh, several books written by uh, Christian scholars like Haru Larry Hortado, Richard Falcom. Uh, I've read James's own books. Uh, you see some of the books I have here. Um, uh, books on the Synoptic Problem, books on the Trinity, books on uh, a wide variety of books. I will continue to do this study, and it may happen that uh, I stumble upon something that causes me to revise my, my entire worldview. I don't know what that thing is in advance, but it could happen. But I'm always open to that. I continue to study, but I also pray to God to, for his guidance. And uh, I, I do so now. I pray God to give me guidance, give James guidance, give everyone here guidance. Guide us to that truth which you want us to accept for our eternal happiness with you forever. Thank you. Amen. Well, when someone asks that question, um, I think we need to recognize uh, there cannot be an end to our discussion, our dialogue, as long as Islam is Islam and Christianity is Christianity. There's no such thing as Chris Islam. The Quran's not going to change. The Bible's not going to change. Uh, the Bible can keep teaching what it's taught, and Surah 112 is going to say, when the other Bible you look for as long as the Quran's going to be around, I think it should be really brief. And therefore, uh, my desire, 
engaging with these, aside from showing respect to the other side by accurately representing them, and by resisting the nasty Islamophobia that many Christians do have, if you can't sit down with a Muslim and talk about your faith because you're too afraid of them, you might be Islamophobic. We should not fear. We should love. And that love means we speak the truth. And that's going to have to continue on. Yes, yes, shut up. <laughs> he went over time a bunch of times, I'm too. Um, we, um, stop. we must continue these dialogues with respect. They can be pitched, they can be strong, they can be straightforward. But we must continue because there's a lot of forces. Shabir, let me, let me say this because I think you agree with me. There's a lot of forces in your country, in my country. You want silence. They don't want this to happen. And the pressure is coming against the Uyghur Muslims in China, against Christians in China. We're praying for our fellow believers. I pray for believers too. If you think that's weird, then I think you've misunderstood something. Because those people are coming after all of us. And so we're going to be pushed into a smaller and smaller space. We don't respect one another. And respect one another enough to tell each other the truth without getting angry and starting to throw stuff at each other. We're going to be in big trouble. Folks, this world's changing. I think about when you and I first started in 2006, your beard was black. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Go look at the face a lot. Either one of us were grandparents. We've been doing this a lot. We respect each other. I think both of us drive the other one crazy once in a while. But hopefully we're demonstrating to everybody that this can be done. What I'm saying is it needs to be done even more than when we first started. Even more than when we first started. So I just want to thank everybody for being here this evening and for asking this. Thank you, gentlemen, for putting it together. And I hope it's been a benefit to everybody. Take the time to listen to both of us. Thank you very much. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have. So those of you who had a question didn't get to answer it, I'm so sorry. All good things must come to an end. We have to go to sleep at some point tonight. Um, so like Jim, uh, Dr. James said, uh, there will be a video for this debate up online. Um, it will be on the Why Should I Believe YouTube page by the end of this week. Um, also a bit of a surprise, there's actually a t-shirt that we designed for this debate. Unfortunately, I can't show it on the projector, but trust me, it's nice. <laughs> and all of you should consider buying it. If you want to look at the design for the t-shirt, uh, you can find all that information on tinyurl.com slash gt debate tinyurl.com slash gt debate so right afterwards maybe once again thank you all so much for coming out tonight and thank you dr jimmy white and dr Peter ali for being here with us it's been an honor and a privilege to have to host you guys at our university can we please get one more round of applause for Drive safe, have a good night, thank you.